And there it is. You're looking at the American-made rocket and spacecraft that will return American astronauts to the International Space Station from American soil for the first time since the retirement of the space shuttle last flown nearly nine years ago. Today, with our partners at SpaceX, we mark a new first in NASA's storied history and usher in the commercial crew era of American spaceflight. At 4.33. Eastern time this afternoon, two of NASA's finest, astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Bankin, will lift off from Pad 39A aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft atop a Falcon 9 rocket. This will mark SpaceX's first flight with crew and the beginning of a new chapter in human spaceflight. Good afternoon and welcome to Kennedy Space Center. I'm Marie Lewis of NASA. And I'm Lauren Lyons, an engineer at SpaceX. And today we have special guest, retired astronaut Leland Melvin, who is here to provide a truly unique perspective on today's events. Marie and Lauren, thanks for having me here. And I am, like, so excited. I've got rocket fuel going through my veins. And you guys, I was out there 11 years ago on Path 39A on STS-129. And this is really hollowed ground that we have here. And you think about the story legacy of Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, shuttle, and now this new era, SpaceX Crew Dragon. It's, a, it's an exciting, exciting time. Yeah, it's going to be awesome, and we're so excited to have you here uh, to go through it with us. We want to talk first, though, about the weather, because that's the big story of the day right now, the headline. And teams from NASA and SpaceX are keeping an eye on the weather here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Meteorologists from the U.S. Air Force 45th Weather Squadron are predicting a 50-50 probability for launch, so keeping things exciting. A rain shower passed through the area just a moment before the start of our coverage, which delayed us by just a few minutes, and which is why we are indoors now. That weather is expected to pass, but teams will continue to monitor our flight rules, including flight through precipitation, as well as anvil and cumulus clouds around the launch pad. Teams look at more than just the weather around Kennedy, but also weather and sea states in the flight path of Crew Dragon. That's really important. All of those need to be favorable before launch. Now, Tropical Storm Bertha has been causing some weather that teams will continue to monitor to make sure it's okay for rescue operations just in case that's needed. And the team will convene shortly to review the latest weather and wind trends around the flight path of the rocket and make a decision about proceeding. Now, if all is go, we will be tracking a 4.33 p.m. Eastern launch for the return of human spaceflight to the International Space Station from U.S. soil. And the team also will take another look at weather prior to propellant loading, which is scheduled to happen about 45 minutes prior to launch if we do, in fact, proceed. And we have teams all over the country covering the action from SpaceX headquarters in California, Mission Control in Houston, our social media desk in Washington, and of course, right here in Florida. Today's mission marks Crew Dragon's second test flight and its first test with humans on board. We're about, uh, let's see, four hours and nine minutes away from liftoff, and Bob and Doug finished their lunch just recently. And now they're going through their final medical checks before NASA turns them over to the SpaceX team. Once the crew is handed over, there are a series of key milestones that the teams will need to complete as we count down to T0. The first one is suit up. The suit-up room is located in NASA's Operations and Checkout Building, or the ONC Building, as we'll sometimes refer to it today. This is where the SpaceX team will help astronauts put on their suits in preparation for their journey to the launch pad. From there, next up is what we call crew walkout. Once their suits, up, once suit up is complete, the astronauts will leave the ONC for final goodbyes with friends and family that are gathered outside of the facility before they head out to pad 39A. And following final goodbyes, the crew will get in their Tesla and begin the roughly 20-minute drive to pad 39A. Now, once at the pad, the crew will ascend the fixed service structure in order to board the spacecraft in a process we call ingress. During ingress, the SpaceX team will run a series of checks to ensure the suits, seats, and vehicle interactions all are functioning properly. And after all vehicle and crew checkouts are completed, the SpaceX closeout team will close Dragon's hatch with Bob and Doug safely inside. About 40 minutes before launch, the crew access arm, which is the long walkway that the astronauts use to board Dragon, it'll retract away, followed shortly thereafter by arming of the launch escape system. 
Once the arm is retracted and the escape system armed, propellant loading on Falcon 9 will begin. About five minutes before liftoff, Dragon will be configured for what we call terminal count. This is where Dragon's onboard computers take control of the vehicle. And at T0, just under four hours from now, we expect to see Crew Dragon atop Falcon 9 lift off from pad 39A, carrying astronauts Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley. Roughly 12 minutes after liftoff, Dragon will separate from the Falcon 9 second stage, with Dragon officially taking over full responsibility for the remainder of the journey to the space station. And as I mentioned previously, Bob and Doug are just finishing up their launch, and we are currently awaiting their arrival to the suit-up room. And while we await that moment, you will notice over the course of this broadcast, we do not have crowds gathered here at Kennedy Space Center. And that, of course, is one of the protocols we've taken to protect each other and our teams. We would normally have tens of thousands of guests here at Kennedy Space Center to view the launch. But even though we couldn't host a lot of people here, you can still join us every historic mission from right where you are. And we have a team dedicated to those of you following along on social media. That's NASA's Tahira Allen, and she is in Washington right now leading that effort. Tahira? Thanks, Marie. And hey, everyone, I'm Tahira Allen, here to bring you all the excitement happening across the nation today. This is a big day for both NASA and SpaceX, and we want to share it with you. You can join the conversation online by using the hashtag LaunchAmerica on NASA's Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. We'll be monitoring that hashtag, LaunchAmerica, don't forget, all day to share some of your questions, comments, and photos live on air. There will also be multiple opportunities for you to engage in a few social media polls during today's live broadcast, so head on over to NASA's Twitter to cast your votes. While you're counting down to liftoff, be sure to check out our custom Launch America Facebook and Instagram augmented reality filters. I promise you will not be disappointed. They transport you right to our launch viewing site at Kennedy Space Center, where you can literally see the Falcon 9 rocket lift off in a pair of sunglasses. If you're looking for some behind the scenes action, I highly recommend check out NASA's Facebook page to join the first ever global NASA social. So in this group, you'll find tours of Kennedy Space Center. You'll get this awesome Launch America badge. We even have some social team members in there making custom badges where you can add your face in it, a little, pers little personalized touch. And you'll also just find a really great community of others pumped to witness this historic launch. So like I said, head on over to NASA's Facebook page to join this group. So to get, you, get everyone started today, we have a question for you out on Twitter. We'd like to know which of you watched the final space shuttle launch in 2011. So like I said, head on over to NASA's Twitter to cast your vote because we'll be sharing the results live on air. And with that, let's head back to Lauren at NASA Kennedy. Lauren. Thanks, Tahira. Wherever you are in the world, we are super excited to have you joining us today and experiencing these historic moments. The purpose of today's demonstration mission is to put Crew Dragon through the final operational paces that are necessary to officially certify the vehicle for human spaceflight. Both the SpaceX and NASA teams have put years of development, testing, and training into this effort, and we are now just hours away from seeing Falcon 9, Crew Dragon, and Bob and Doug lift off from the first time from the same launch pad that first sent humans to the moon more than 50 years ago. And we're just about three miles from Launch Complex 39A, where liftoff will happen in a little over four hours. Let's check in with the team at SpaceX Hawthorne, where NASA's Dan Hewitt and SpaceX's Jesse Anderson are keeping an ear on operations. Hi, guys. Thanks, Marie. And hello from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. My name's Dan Hewitt. Really excited to be here today for this historic launch. And Dan, we are so excited to have you here with us. My name is Jesse Anderson, and I'm a lead manufacturing engineer here at SpaceX. We are so honored to be NASA's partner in returning humans to space from the shores of Kennedy Space Center. Ten years ago, we sent the dragon that's displayed right behind us on its first orbital demonstration flight. And I when I say we could not be sending humans to the International Space Station. <laughs> a great day. Today's mission is known as Demonstration Mission 2 or Demo 2. It's going to be the first time a commercially built spacecraft will launch people to the space station. 
Demo 2 is an end-to-end -end flight test from launch all the way to docking and ending with splashdown. And it's the final test for... Right now, SpaceX and NASA have teams working together around the country. On the SpaceX side, team... ...to make sure Dragon is healthy and good to go. At the moment... ...from our firing room in Florida to Mission Control here in Hawthorne. Mission Control will have insight and command of Dragon systems for the entirety of this upcoming mission. Since Dragon is a highly autonomous vehicle, our teams in Mission Control will be continuously monitoring the health and performance of the spacecraft through the entire duration of its journey, from liftoff all the way until Dragon splashes back down on Earth. And while there are a number of people on headset in Mission Control right behind us, the mission, the mission director is the one in charge. It's also where the SpaceX core, which stands for Crew Operations Responsible Engineer, Dragon and Falcon 9 together have years of operational experience, or what we refer to as 22 flights of Dragon to and from orbit since 2010, and that includes 21 trips to the International Space Station. To get us where we are today, not only have we conducted thousands of t hours of testing, but we've also enhanced and added a number of safety features to Dragon. And one of those most important safety It's a huge advancement in the safety of human spaceflight. We were able to demonstrate first back in May 2000, or recently just last January. The system is outfitted with eight Super Draco engines that are integrated directly into the spacecraft body. This enables Dragon to separate from Falcon 9 and carry astronauts to safety in case of an emergency on the launch pad or all the way up to orbit. In addition to the launch escape system, SpaceX has completed over 80 parachute tests, which include nearly 30 tests of just the upgraded Mark III parachutes flying on today's vehicle. And this is to ensure a safe landing back on Earth, even in the unlikely event that one of those four main parachutes fails. And let's not forget the significance of our first demonstration mission, which took place just last year. And that was also an end-to-end -end flight test to and from the International Space Station. Just no humans on board that time. For now, though, let's turn it over to SpaceX's principal integration engineer, John Innsbrucker, for our first status update. John? Hello from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. As Dan said, I'm John Innsbrucker, and I'll be bringing you status updates throughout the countdown. We're currently coming up at T-minus four hours and counting for the launch of Falcon 9 with Dragon to the space station. Listening right now to see if we get a status brief on the countdown net while we wait for that point out the major event that get us to this point so far was the static fire of the Falcon 9 that was five days ago. We rolled the Falcon 9 with the Dragon capsule to the launch pad and static fire was performed on the 22nd. Launch director, the countdown at T-minus oh, four hours. We're going to wait a minute, listen to the Future launch director, today brief. Is 20 hours, 33 minutes, 35 seconds, that is 4, 33, 35 p.m. Eastern. Still waiting the final conjunction analysis report. The crew has just arrived in the suit-up room following the weather brief, and suit-up and leak checks are currently underway. Tracking no open issues at this time, though launch weather remains a watch item. Upper-level winds currently look acceptable for flight. We have no constraints performing uh, any section of this procedure. A reminder, we will use procedure 52.911, crew contingency procedures for any required crew contingency actions. One final reminder for handover to CNLD that at T-minus an hour, we'll ask that any personnel not intending to be in the room during propellant load and launch will need to clear out the subsequent 15 minutes. We'll look for all personnel to be in their seats, settled, and remaining in their position through ascent. Dragon separation at T-plus 12 minutes and 2 seconds. Now over to CE for Falcon 9 help. Falcon 9 is in good health, the uh, COPVs are at pressure, AFDS checkouts are complete, and uh, we have a clean alarm sport. We are proceeding down, no concerns on our end. No questions, back to LD. Thank you, CE, and MD for Dragon Health. Good morning, LD. Dragon is healthy. We're not tracking any issues here for the countdown. Dragon has completed its prop tank pressurization. 
and is in a good configuration for crew ingress. Uh, that's the next item that we'll be waiting for and uh, no issues at this time. Thank you, MD. Next step with the crew, I uh, expect a walkout in about 45 minutes to begin the transport out to pad 39A. This concludes the countdown briefing. Thank you. John Insparker back with you again at the webcast desk. That was SpaceX Launch Director Mike Taylor giving the situational briefing at T-minus four hours. Everything sounded well. You can see the Falcon 9 on the pad. As I mentioned, we static fired last week. The vehicle's been on the pad since then. We did the review of static fire. Everything looked good. Now we are getting ready for the crew ingress coming up, as uh, the launch director said, a little bit later this morning. Now, most recently, activity on the Dragon late load cargo was put on a couple of days ago. Now we're ready for the crew to come out to the pad, down the access arm, and load into the capsule. Now, at the same time, we are also watching the weather. You heard the launch director talk about the weather brief we got 15 minutes ago. The tropical storm has begun moving onshore. That's actually improving conditions, both downrange and emergency splashdown locations if needed for Dragon, as well as at the launch site. We do expect, though, the probability of violating conditions is still 60%. The concerns at liftoff are gonna be flight through precipitation, the thick cumulus crowds, and the possibility of violating the lightning rule. But right now, everything is still go. So with everything looking good from Hawthorne, we're gonna send you down to Houston, where Gary Jordan is with the uh, flight control the team at NASA's Johnson Space Center in the Mission Control, Houston. How are the teams looking down there, Gary? Thanks, John, and welcome everyone to Mission Control Houston. Today, I'm joined remotely by NASA astronaut Tom Marshburn. From this room, we've been supporting humans aboard the International Space Station for nearly 20 years, nonstop, every single day. Crews from all over the globe have visited the orbiting station, but it's been almost nine years since they started their journey into space from American shores. And while the teams here may have appeared subdued and focused, there's definitely an excitement around the entire center to be returning launch operations to America. Is, and our astronauts are thrilled to be taking a new spacecraft into orbit. This will be the new first for us, flying to space on a commercial vehicle, and the entire astronaut corps will be watching. As with every first flight of the system, there are still things to be learned and proven out, but we believe this crew and this system is ready. You know, many people think of mission control when they think of Johnson Space Center, but this center is also home to world-class training facilities and thought leaders in spacecraft development. We have drawn from both of these disciplines and spent the last three years alongside the SpaceX team to make sure the Crew Dragon is the best spacecraft possible and that the astronauts are prepared for every scenario. And this mission comes at a critical time for the space station with only three crew members currently aboard, among them NASA's Chris Cassidy as the lone American. Now I'm told uh, we just had the formal handoff of the crew from the NASA team that has supported Hurley and Bacon in their two-week quarantine over to the SpaceX team that'll get them suited up. There will be a lot of first today, including a new suit for the crew to use during launch and entry. The crew quarters at, spa at Kennedy Space Center has supported human spaceflight for five decades, and now a new chapter is being written. And it's exciting to witness it here today. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Let's go back to the Kennedy Space Center to watch Suit Up in action as we continue to count down to launch. Leland. Hey, thanks, Gary. Hey, Marie, this is amazing. We're in the Suit Up room. I mean, I remember this back in 2009 when I was sitting in Lazy Boys from back in the Apollo era, but they have these really cool new suits and new seats that they're, they're working in here, so. Yeah, it's so amazing to see this first live look in the room. There's astronauts Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley sitting in those seats, um, being helped by the suit technicians. Uh, this room was first used for the first Apollo mission, Apollo 7, um, that they suited up in there in 1968. And there they are, uh, giving a thumbs up. That looks like Doug giving a thumbs up there. Of course, um, Bob was mission specialist on STS-123 um, and STS-130. Bob's a native of St. Anne, Missouri, so I'm sure folks in his hometown are watching. Lots of hometown pride going on right now. And same for Doug. Um, he was born in Endicott, New York, which happens to be my hometown, too. Oh, wow. Um, okay. But he considers Appalachian his hometown, so I know folks are watching there. And 
Doug was the pilot on STS-127, STS-135, which was the final shuttle flight. Um, so it's so cool to see them in there, uh, Lauren and Leland. Last time this room was used for this purpose that you see here was STS-135 in 2011, and Doug Hurley was one of the astronauts in there doing that. So this is really amazing to see. Wow, so the suits are actually much more than just garments. They actually connect directly into Dragon seats. As you can see there, those GSC seats or ground support equipment seats are essentially replicas of the seats that are inside of the Dragon spacecraft. And the seats provide communications uh, as through an umbilical, umbilical, but also the ability to pressurize the suit if necessary. So right now what the, the suit team is doing is they're doing communications checks as well as a pressure check to make sure that the, the spacesuit can hold pressure in the event of a cabin depressurization emergency. This is the last time that we're going to do this check prior to the crew boarding Dragon where we'll do it all again. So the way that that leak check will work is we will provide or essentially inflate the suit with air and hold that pressure for a few minutes, watch the depressurization rate, and make sure that it stays within bounds. And as we stay looking in the suit up room, you can see Doug Hurley there in the seat. He is the spacecraft commander for Demo 2. And while he continues with checkouts, we want to give you a closer look at the veteran Marine Corps fighter pilot and spaceflight pioneer. Very excited, yeah, very excited. You feel ready, no pumps? Oh yeah, I think we're ready. Uh, I think we're certainly ready. Joining the SpaceX Demo 2 test. He is a Marine Corps Colonel and test pilot. He was selected as an astronaut in 2000. He piloted Space Shuttle Endeavor and Atlantis for STS-135, the final Space Shuttle mission. Introducing NASA astronaut Doug Hurley. It's a life-changing process in so many ways to fly into space. It's just overwhelming in some, some respects. Just the sensations, the rumbling, the shaking, the acceleration. When the engine shut off and you go from, in the case of the shuttle, you go from three Gs to zero Gs instantaneously and things start floating. And, and I remember distinctly just thinking what just happened. To see a rocket launch in person is, uh, it's a pretty emotional event. I remember the first time I saw a shuttle launch and it's just, it was amazing. And then when I saw a shuttle launch with my wife on it, that is, that is quite the emotional experience. My name is Doug Hurley and I'm the spacecraft commander for the Demo 2 mission to the International Space Station. doing the first crewed flight for NASA and for SpaceX. So this is the test flight to prove end-to-end -end from launch to docking to ISS operations and then entry, descent, and landing. This will be the first time the Dragon had a crew on board. And so there's a, a, a myriad of objectives we want to achieve for this mission. SpaceX has been responsible for design and and, and essentially making this vehicle what it is. What the astronauts bring to the table is the crew vehicle interface. What would work on orbit, what might not work on orbit, what would definitely work to be able to just have the entire integrated uh, team that's gonna support us getting to and from space station, talking together, working through the challenges that simulators typically uh, throw at you. It was really neat being part of it. It's just been an incredible undertaking to see where we've come just in the last five years that, that Bob and I have been a part of this and to be, you know, shortly uh, flying to the International Space Station with the Crew Dragon. It overwhelms you to think about how many people have in some way, shape or form touched this program and this, and this vehicle to get us to this point. And 
you know, we are the lucky ones that get to fly it, but we certainly not for one second take for granted the amount of effort that so many other people had to put into this to make it successful. For Doug personally, he's, he's worked so hard, I mean, through his entire life, um, to get to where we are right now. As a test pilot, this would be the dream to fly a new vehicle. So it makes me so happy to see that he gets to be part of this mission, the spacecraft commander. I'm just glad to see his hard work and his dream come true for that. It's been a long road in a lot of ways for not only us, but certainly for all the folks that work in the commercial crew program, as well as SpaceX, in our case, just working to get to this point. It's been a huge amount of sacrifice and, and time away from home, but the fruits of our labor are, are coming to uh, fruition. We are now getting closer to when we expect to see the crew complete their suit, trek, suit checks and walk out of the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building. And before they do, here's an introduction to the Joint Operations Commander for Demo 2 and former Air Force flight test engineer, astronaut Bob Benkin. When you go through the, the launch day preparations, there's a lot of moments that, that kind of stand out to you. One is the kind of the celebratory piece of it, which is that you're walking out of the suit up room and uh, getting in the vehicle that's going to take you to the launch pad. When you close the hatch, you know, that's really when Doug and I are in the vehicle and it's our vehicle and, you know, we're really in control of the mission uh, at that point. Test pilots, their task proved that man could fly into orbit around the Earth and return live and well to talk about it. There's always a, a balance of managing risk as you go forward to execute a test point and figuring out a way to, you know, collect the data. We hear a sound, okay, is that sound an expected sound? Or we see a light, is that light an expected light? Um, what's the source of it? Does it sync up with something else that's going on or not? So trying to dissect all of that in real time in your head is, uh, you know, a lot of things happen like that on, a, on launching of a vehicle. From St. Anne, Missouri, he is an Air Force Colonel and flight test engineer. He flew aboard Space Shuttle Endeavor twice, introducing NASA astronaut Bob Bankin. My career at NASA has uh, kind of spanned a, a couple of decades at this point. I, I arrived with the class of 2000. Uh, went through the training program, primarily focused on the space shuttle and the International Space Station, learning those systems. Having uh, launched a couple times on vehicles, you know, the, the second time was definitely different than the first time. You can feel a little bit guilty of, hey, should I study one more thing? Or is there one more piece of information I should get? Am I really prepared or not? Um, so that's definitely different between uh, uh, where I was on my first flight and where I'm at right now. It's been uh, uh, really interesting, I think, for both my wife and I to have gone through the process of seeing each other uh, launch in space. I've seen her take that risk and had it be in front of her, and uh, I've done that to her. There's just something different about watching a rocket launch when there are people on board. You feel a little bit differently about the pit of your stomach, and I can only tell you it's multiplied uh, significantly when it's uh, somebody that you know, and then somebody, of course, that's a family member. It's even multiplied more. For me personally, as a spouse, watching um, everything that Bob has put into this over the last five years, um, the dedication that he's shown, the perseverance is pretty special. For both of us though, the, the way our minds work, it won't be until sort of the mission is complete that you have really a chance to savor it and celebrate it. This is a huge accomplishment for uh, an Air Force flight test engineer to be part of the demonstration mission of a brand new vehicle. It's going to be amazing. Without a, a partner that has that same appreciation, I think it can be challenging for some folks. There's a, there's a lot of work and a lot of time that uh, takes away from family that, uh, you know, that my spouse appreciates, and I love her for that. Really, my role on the Demo 2 mission is to make sure that we get this vehicle uh, tested and evaluated so that we can move on to more operational missions at the International Space Station. 
we've got a lot of objectives uh, on board the uh, vehicle that we need to accomplish to, to really make sure that it's uh, good to go. We'll make sure all those systems are working uh, during the test flight so that the future missions uh, will have them available even if they don't plan to utilize them. Through years of the, the NASA team, I'm helping to share that experience and teaching them the lessons that we've learned by going through this. Now there's another capability in the U.S. besides NASA to operate something of this magnitude. When is the last time humans launched on a, a new vehicle? Certainly on the, the American side, it's, it's been several decades. Now we're in a time when we've got multiple vehicles under development. It's a great time from a, a space exploration time frame just to see all that happening. And it's because of this nurturing of the environment, being able to pull in a, a wider group of people who can contribute towards a human spaceflight. It's just a, it's a super cool time. On a deeply personal uh, level, I, I'm really excited that my son has got to get a chance to see me uh, launch into space. Being an astronaut has been a little bit of a, an abstraction thing for him because he's seen me do it in old videos, uh, but he hasn't seen me do it for real. And so I'm excited for him to see uh, this launch. I want to thank the entire commercial crew program team that's worked together to get to this point where we've got vehicles in the launch pad ready to head to the International Space Station. And we're back live in the room now with Bob Bankin on the left of your screen, Doug Hurley to the right. Uh, this is such a cool sight here, Leland. I, this must bring back a lot of memories for you. Maria, it really does. I mean, I, you know, looking at these new suits and these new seats, it, it's a little different than what I experienced uh, 11 years ago. But it's all the same. The suit, the, uh, the suit techs, the people around you that have been with you, getting you ready for this mission. It's just uh, an amazing moment. And they're getting excited. You can see, you know, these military guys don't really get that excited. They don't show their excitement like uh, <laughs> civilians do. But, um, but it's, again, it's a, it's a moment of history. And uh, we're getting ready for this momentous occasion. Yeah, and we're, uh, it was pretty cool. We heard that earlier this morning they, they stepped outside with a cup of coffee in hand. Oh, we've got some, some visitors in the room now. It looks like uh, SpaceX founder Elon Musk uh, to the right of your screen and NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein. Of course, you see a, a partition there to keep them a safe distance from the crew, but they're in there to say hello, wish them well uh, before they depart the suit-up room. That's really cool to see there, and, and we can't hear what they're saying, but uh, I'd love to be a fly on the wall in there right now. Lauren, I wonder what Elon is saying. Oh, just probably telling them how, how honored he is to, to be able to give them a ride today. And I know the NASA administrator, he talked about this yesterday. I mean, he's met with the crew uh, before today even and said, you know, I told Bob and Doug, it's not too late to call this off <laughs> if you have any second thoughts. And, of course, they, they had none. Um, they're super pumped about this, ready to go. And right now it's just, you know, we just need the weather to cooperate. Yeah, I try to think who could potentially be more excited than the SpaceXers. Bob and Doug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? And, you know, it's amazing how we have commercial and, and government working together to send these two NASA astronauts to space safely. It's just uh, it's a great combination of what we can do when we put our minds to things and be creative and innovative and work together as one community. I, I totally agree, Leland. Um, you know, I, I see Bob and Doug walking around our headquarters in Hawthorne all the time. They're basically family members. They, they're in the cafeteria. They're getting a drink from the soda machine. Um, every now and then, they, there are times when the, the teams can have breakfast with them, which is really cool. And uh, we call them the dads. <laughs> <laughs> the dads. <laughs> they're well, they are dads. It's they fitting. are. And they're incredible human beings. They, they really are. They're, they're brilliant. They're, they're sharp. They are excellent to work with, but they're just great people. Yeah. No, I, I'm really um, inspired and honored to have known these two guys, and I, I can't wait to see them launch in space. And I was with you, uh, Lauren, out at SpaceX when we were doing a little tour, and I think you kind of snuck me back in to where they were training, and I got the chance to see them working and training. But when they came back out, I was having lunch, and everyone around was just like, hey, these are our team also. Yes, yeah. yes. It's really amazing. And Lauren, you said, I mean, you talked about what they're like, and they are just two of the most humble people, too. I mean, any every time I've seen them do an interview, they and, you know, they're they're getting asked questions about themselves. Right. Because they're the stars of the show. Um, right. They're the ones getting on the rocket. But they always bring it back to 
the people who made it possible for them. They're right. always talking about the, the NASA team, the SpaceX team working behind the scenes that have sacrificed so much to keep them safe and made sure that they are always vigilant. Um, and, and I know we've talked about this before, too, but, you know, if you're not looking for something wrong, you're not doing it right. So the, the teams, even now, they're always looking for any little thing that could go wrong to make sure that Bob and Doug are safe when they strap in and get going. Absolutely. Uh, around the office, we don't just say, oh, we're launching a rocket, we're, dro we're launching Dragon. We say, we're launching Bob and Doug. And that human element of this is essentially leveling SpaceX up in a major way today. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, all the technology, all the hardware means nothing if it's all about the people. Absolutely. And, um, you know, we see just a handful of folks in the room and we've acknowledged the, the distance that uh, Mr. Musk and Mr. Bridenstine are standing from the astronauts. And they, of course, they have masks on. This wouldn't really look that much different, though, even if we were not in the midst of a pandemic. I mean, Leland, you know very well how what it's like to live in quarantine, getting ready for a mission. And so this this coronavirus situation has just kind of underscored the importance of quarantine and keeping the astronauts protected. But can you speak a little bit about uh, what it's like to live in quarantine, getting ready for a mission? Yeah, we started in quarantine about a week before, you know, before we come down to the Cape to get ready for launch. And I think that everyone around you that comes to the crew dinners, they have to get checked by the doctors. And so we really make this a very serious thing, even without a, a camp pandemic going on. But I think once we get down here, like we have these crew parties for our families and, you know, we can't go to the parties. We have to FaceTime into the parties. But, you know, that's a very serious thing. And we only see our our, our spouses at the at the beach house and have a dinner and, and, and celebrate this momentous moment. But it's a, it's a very serious thing, even without pandemics going on. Absolutely. And obviously, Doug Hurley and Bob Bankin are two of the best at what they do. And it's starting to really sink in that the mission is on as you see them in their suits there. It's getting real. It's getting real. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember the very first time that I saw Bob and Doug in these suits at a crew training event at SpaceX. Not only did they look really awesome, you know, astronauts tend to look pretty cool, um, but the suits look like they were from the future. Um, our team designed the spacesuits to maximize safety and functionality with a little bit of style. And so here's Chris Trigg telling us how the SpaceX spacesuit came to be. I think one of the things that was important in the development of the suit was to make it easy to use, something that the crew just has to literally plug in when they sit down and then the, the suit kind of takes care of itself from there. So the suit is really kind of one part of the bigger Dragon system. It's really part of the vehicle. So um, we think of it as kind of a suit seat system. So the seat that the crew is in and the suit are in a lot of ways working together. And so it made sense that we were designing Dragon in-house to also design the suit. Our spacesuit is completely designed in-house. It's built here in Hawthorne, California, in the same building as the rocket and the capsule. The spacesuit is uh, custom-made for each crew member, and that is to optimize the fit for the crew member. We definitely wanted to innovate, and we wanted it to look inspiring, but first and foremost, we wanted it to be, be safe and reliable. The spacesuit's primary purpose is to protect the crew in the unlikely event that the cabin were to depressurize. But the suit does a number of additional things. It provides cooling and communication to the crew inside of the suit, provides them hearing protection, and the outer layer of the suit is flame resistant, so it provides flame protection as well. When the crew gets in the capsule, they get in their seats and they plug the suit into the umbilical that's attached to the seat. And the umbilical is providing everything that the suit needs, so it provides um, the avionics or electronics for communications is providing the air to cool the suit and it also provides gas when needed to pressurize the suit. So it's really a single point that lets the suit do all the things that it needs to do. We designed the helmet in-house. The helmet serves a number of different functions. Obviously it's protecting the crew's head and it's retaining gas like the rest of the suit, but it also houses the microphones as well as the valves that are, are regulating pressure in the suit. We had to design the gloves so that they would work with the touchscreen, but the gloves also had to do a number of other things like the rest of the suit. So all of those things had to come together uh, within the glove. It'll be obviously really amazing to see Bob and Doug in their flight suits. And I think one of the things that's cool about the suit is it's not just a piece of hardware. It's not just a suit. It's a very personal thing. It's Bob's suit and it's Doug's suit. And so seeing the two of them in their, in their suits, using it in flight will be just uh, a really amazing thing.
Hey, now that you've had a look at the development of the spacesuit, we thought it'd be pretty cool to show you where our astronauts train to be able to fly on board Dragon. Yesterday, Dan and I had a chance to spend some time in our crew training facility here in Hawthorne. So let's take a look. So we are up in the crew training area. This is right where Bob and Doug have been training over the last several months and even years to get ready for this flight. There's a couple of things in the room that we're going to show you real quick. We're going to start off with the cockpit simulator. Now, there are four seats inside of Dragon, the way it's configured. The two in the middle are where the commander and the pilot seat. So this is the commander seat. This is where Doug Hurley is for this flight. And this is the pilot seat. This is where Bob Bankin is. Once they're in their suits, they can plug them into the seats. They get communications, breathing air, pressurized gas for the suits themselves. Everything just integrated into Dragon systems. But most importantly, right in front of them, we have this set of three displays. And these are the touchscreen displays that give them access to Dragon. This is their window into their spacecraft. They're able to see all of the different systems. They're able to take control of Dragon. They're able to see where they are over the Earth or in relation to the space station. They're able to see even when thrusters are firing. Or, and if you keep your eye on this little dot, you've been hearing some background noise. We actually have recorded noises of those thrusters that they're able to hear and see in real time while they're training. There's also some hard-coded buttons for some of the more important things, like the pyrotechnics, if they need to cut the main parachute after they land in the water, and of course the launch escape system. So they spend a lot of time in here just getting familiar with Dragon's control systems, but you need a bigger picture. You need to put it all together. And to do that, we can come over here where you just want something a little more higher fidelity, where you have everything from the seats, the displays, the cargo, all of it, just to really make sure you're training so by the time you get up to space, it feels like you've almost been there before. And that's where we're going to find Jesse. Oh, hey there. I was just training for my next mission to space. But since you're here, let me show you around. This is our flight simulator, which is basically a one-to-one -one replica of a Crew Dragon vehicle as far as the functionality and the interior. So the astronauts can get suited up, they can practice entering and exiting the vehicle, they can climb into their seats and actually get strapped in. These seats were climbed back so that they can access these display panels which are actually functional. And then they can practice flying the vehicle, manually docking with the space station, they can open and close the hatch, and basically by the time they, they get to a day like today, they felt like they've already done the mission a hundred times before. Well, I'm going to get back to training, so let's get back to launch. We're coming up on T minus three and a half hours, and all continues to go well for today's launch. Now, at the launch pad, Falcon 9 is powered on. Engine and stage checkouts were performed several hours ago. Everything's looking good on those. Now, we're currently monitoring telemetry and pressurizing the gas storage vessels on board both the first and second stages. And as I mentioned, the good news is there's nothing significant to report on the rocket. Now, on top of the Falcon 9 in the picture there, behind the crew access arm is the Dragon spacecraft. The spacecraft is ready for the crew who you saw suiting up. They'll be walking out here shortly. We'll bring that to you. Functional checkouts of the spacecraft were performed in preparation for the crew arrival. Most recently, the Dragon propellant system was pressurized to the final flight pressure just about an hour ago. And currently, all spacecraft systems are go. Uh, right now on the pad, you can see some silhouettes in the access arm. The Ingress technician team is up there. They've opened the side hatch and now getting ready for the crew to arrive a little later this afternoon. Now, the Air Force range is supporting us today with air and sea space clearance. They've got no issues at this time. We're also releasing weather balloons. The initial balloons have been released. They don't give us a go for a launch, but they start to tell us that things in the upper altitude are acceptable if this trend continues. So while we're going to wait on those results to give us a better idea, all the way down to about T minus 30 minutes, we are anticipating acceptable weather for launch at the upper altitudes. And as you heard earlier, at the ground level, things look like they'll be improving through the afternoon as well as downrange. So things are looking good with both Falcon and Dragon. The weather is cooperating as we count down to liftoff. And we want to see where you're following today's launch from. So let's jump over to Tahira at our social desk. 
Thanks, John. And I can tell you the excitement is really building online. Right now, we're up to 700,000 people viewing this broadcast. And Launch America is the number three trending on Twitter in the U.S. So let's take a closer look at what's being said. Looks like we have Astro Joan, who is just so excited to be on the Space Coast and watching this launch from her driveway. And with that, so jealous to all of you in Florida right now that have the ability to just step outside and witness Bob and Doug make this historic moment. Let's take a look at another. So we have Dave Farrell, and this is the Dave Farrell, the bassist from Lincoln Park, which is just sick in general. And it looks like his kids coined the term nerve sighted for today's mission. And this is perfect. I was actually looking for a word to just describe the jitters and excitement leading up to launch. So Dave, thank you for that. I will be stealing that for today's show. So let's take just a broader look at the conversation online right now with this heat map of the United States. So you'll see that the more purple states show the states with the most mentions of Launch America. And with that, it looks like the Florida Space Coast is really coming alive for today's launch, followed by California, home of SpaceX, and Texas, where our mission control is. So great to see all these home teams showing up for today's historic mission. I want to toss it back to Florida, though, because I have to reiterate, if you have a chance to go to Florida and watch one of these launches in person, it's great. I watched my first one last year, and that was the uncrewed test flight of today's mission. And even then, uncrewed, I literally cried. I mean, you cannot... You cannot describe the emotion that comes over to see this in person, so highly recommend if you get a chance, go, to, go on down to Florida. For those of you just tuning in, we are using the hashtag Launch America on NASA's social media channels, so join the conversation with us and maybe we'll show it during the broadcast. So earlier in the show, we polled users on Twitter to see which of you watched the final shuttle launch in 2011, and the results are in. So, looks, at about, looks like about 40% of you were able to watch the last shuttle launch, but 60% of you weren't. And I have to say, I'm not going to lie, I'm with those 60%. This will be my first time watching humans lift off to space from the U.S., and I, I am not kidding when I tell you I am literally thrilled to do this and share it with you all today. So the next question we have for you, as Bob and Doug finish their final suit checks, we would like to know if you were in the room with them right now. What would you say to them on social media? Use the hashtag Launch America and we'll show it later on in the show. Now let's head back to Marie at Kennedy. Marie. All right, thanks to Hira. We're looking live at the back doors of the ONC building. Those are the iconic doors that Bob and Doug are going to be walking out in just a minute. But first, we want to pause to honor today's efforts with our national anthem. And the incomparable Kelly Clarkson treats us now with her virtual rendition from her home to yours. Mose, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we have at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars
And any moment now, uh, we, we are going to see Bob and Doug uh, walking out. We're looking at the pad right now, but you guys, that just gave me chills uh, listening to that. And we saw them getting into the elevator. So they're making their way down to the first floor where they're going to be walking out of those doors any moment now. Just so exciting to think, you know, back in 11 years ago when I was going down that elevator and about to walk out those doors, it just it just brings back these memories of, of getting human beings to space, working together as a team, and having this entire community around you helping you get off the planet. Yeah, and, and Leland, I know you have a really cool memory about somebody special that you saw when you walked out of those doors. Oh, my goodness, Marie. When oh. I walked out of those doors, my chemistry teacher was right there from high school who inspired me to be a scientist. And she said, go Leland. And that's what's going to happen when they come out. These people that, you know, their families are going to be there. I wish, wish the other people could be there, but um, it's just an amazing moment. Yeah, and the the shot you just saw there with people carefully spaced apart, uh, we saw them walk out right before the anthem started. It was Vice President Mike Pence along with Elon Musk and Jim Bridenstine. Of course, uh, they left the building just ahead of the crew, so they are standing. You're, we're looking now at the doors, but they're standing just right of that um, across from the Teslas. There's also a designated spot for uh, Doug and Bob's immediate families. There's that shot now, so we're looking at the back of uh, Elon Musk, Jim Bridenstine, and Vice President Mike Pence. Uh, of course, there's a small group of media there also, and so we've we've kind of blocked this very carefully to maintain social distancing and those that can't have the masks on. But uh, there's the Teslas waiting for them. They got the meatball. There's the worm in the background and the worm on the back of the Teslas. So, Leland, I know we were talking about this earlier. You had some mixed feelings about the worm, right? I mean, the worm, <laughs> the meatball. You know, when I was at NASA Langley, we changed over to the meatball from the worm. So, Lauren, I know you love the worm. It's a uh, worm all day, all day, really. all day. Seriously? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I love that the worm is so retro and it's only fitting that it would be making its way back, you know, bringing the, the historic just opulence of, yeah, of NASA's yeah, okay. past to, okay. to, to the I'll, present. I'll and, let you have that. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. But thank I mean, the you. Chevron and the meatball goes back to Langley's tradition when it was, you know, in aviation and uh, and that, that gets back to that heritage and that history too so I guess sure okay truce orbits truce. or truce truce I feel like yeah, this yeah. is a microcosm of what's happening online <laughs> about the worm but the meatball's not going away it's it's a worm meatball partnership there we go there we go so there's a there's another view there of uh, the the crosswalk there is where Bob and Doug are going to walk out any moment of course, uh, this, uh, they're going to get their photo taken by all the paparazzi there, um, and we're just standing by for them to walk out. I'm going to check the time, actually, 1.13. So uh, if they walk out any minute now, they're going to be right on schedule uh, to start uh, their final goodbyes and waving to folks, and I'm, I'm sure they're going to pause for a photo op. But uh, this is just really amazing. We haven't seen this site uh, since 2011 with STS-135. Of course, uh, Doug Hurley was the pilot on that mission, so... This is a really incredible moment. Yeah, and one of the one of the crewmates that was with him was Rex Wallham that we're going to talk to later. And we have, oh, here they come. Oh, here they are. Here wow. they come, NASA astronauts Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley. They've each made this journey twice before for the space shuttle missions, but they've never done this in a SpaceX spacesuit. They've never done this together. And they've never done this on their way to head to a commercially built rocket and spacecraft to head to space. Well, I was looking for that Astro van and I see these white Teslas with meatballs and worms on them. It's just a, a new era in space travel. Oh yeah, they're riding in Tesla Model Xs. They have been equipped with cooling units, so once they sit inside, that umbilical that I was referring to earlier uh, will connect to the spacesuit to provide cooling while they're inside of the vehicle. And you can see them talking and waving with their families now. We just saw them do a virtual <laughs> hug uh, with their sons. Here's Megan and Karen and their sons, yeah. They're the dads. <laughs> the dads, yeah. It's so awesome. Bob Lowe and his family a kiss. Doug actually got to take his wife and son up to the up uh, to the pad on the tower uh, yesterday. They tweeted out a photo that was so cool. I saw that picture and it had a prominent worm in the picture, right? <laughs> yes. I'm telling you, worm all day. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's 
So they're climbing through those DeLorean doors of the Model X. It, this is totally from the future. It's Are they stock? Are they stock Teslas? <laughs> <laughs> and then you see in the front seat there, that's our flight surgeon. Uh, he's climbing in, and the suit technicians, um, there's one, Chris Trigg, right there, number 12. He is buckling in. Uh, they, they're both, the two suit techs are buckling in, Bob and Doug, and they're connecting that umbilical. And Lauren, I know you mentioned this earlier, but for folks that maybe weren't watching then or, or can't remember, I mean, it's, it's, we're in Florida, it's super hot, super muggy, so how are they staying cool? There are these portable cooling units. We had one at the ONC building, or sorry, two at the ONC building. There are two in the Teslas. There will be two in the elevators and then two in the white room when they arrive on the crew arm. So we're just keeping that cool air flowing through the suits. There's actually ducting integrated into the suits to keep them cool. And you can see they're saying goodbye to their families. This is awesome. Yeah, it's awesome eh, that their, their families get to come up to the window and obviously get a little closer than oh, everybody wow. else. There's Megan and her uh, son. Yeah. Oh my gosh. These are precious <laughs> moments. This is where just what was what it's all about, as I mentioned before. It's about the people. It's about the families and working together as one community to get Doug and Bob launching off to the cosmos to the space station. Yeah, it's it's emotional. <laughs> it's emotional watching that. It really is. Here we go. Now, as we see the convoy, convoy begin the journey to the pad, 39A, we are thinking about each and every one of you, our colleagues and friends at SpaceX and NASA, who have had a, san a hand in seeing the Crew Dragon commercial crew program come to life. And we wish every single one of you could be here up close to see this, but we want you to be a part of this journey regardless of where you are watching today. And so for the next few minutes, uh, while they're making their way to the pad, we want to highlight those people whose hands and words and thoughts built all that we see here today. And we hope all of you watching can feel that pride that each of these NASA and SpaceX team members has for today. from the Commercial Crew Program. We're so excited about this historical day. Congratulations on being a part of the very first mission for human space flight, commercial human space flight ever. We're behind you, Bob and Doug. I'm Nicole from SpaceX in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Congratulations to SpaceX for hitting another major milestone and safe travels to Bob and Doug. Here. We've got a lot of our launch vehicle team here to wish you a very wonderful yeah. ride on a Falcon 9. Come up to We're so excited for you. And launch America. It's time to launch. Let's go. All right. Hi, this is Perla from Hawthorne headquarters. We want to wish Bob and Doug a safe trip to the International Space Station. Go Dragon! <laughs> in the making. This is such a historic time and our team has worked so hard and we're very excited to be here. Go Bob and Doug! Hi, this is Sam from McGregor, Texas. Go Bob and Doug, go NASA, and go SpaceX. Sean O'Rourke from Guns of State Center. Bob and Doug wishing you a great flight. I just wanted to tell you good luck. <laughs> I'm Dustin Kamak with NASA Kennedy's Communications and Public Engagement Directorate, and we all want to wish Bob and Doug safe travels and Godspeed. You are both an inspiration to us all. Now, let's get out there and launch America. Let's do it. Come on. Launch America. <laughs> And 
and we are following the convoy. And Leela and Lauren, I don't know about you guys, but I, I w I'm so glad that we had the chance to hear from the NASA and SpaceX teams that have been working behind the scenes because, Lauren, I know you know this all too well. I mean, these people have been working not only for, you know, the last uh, – since 2014 when SpaceX won this contract, but, I mean, working long hours, long reviews, coronavirus happened, and then they're homeschooling their kids, still trying to get – through all the all the final checkouts and closeouts to get to today, and we made it. And now we're just waiting on the weather. But uh, <laughs> but it, it's just great that they got a chance to to wish Bob and Doug good luck. Absolutely, it is a bummer that we can't all be here in person. But to to have that opportunity with that wall of tears is is pretty cool. And and you're right. I mean, it's been years of extremely hard work. Fortunately, we've had little milestones milestones along the way, like Demo One and IFA, the in-flight abort mission, but it was all leading up to this. And I speak for all of my friends and colleagues that are still working on this program. Today is a career just high for all of those people, if Absolutely. not the uh, pinnacle of it. Absolutely, and I know Doug and Bob appreciate them so much. And as they continue to make their way to the pad, the next astronauts to make this journey are also watching very closely NASA astronauts Shannon Walker, Victor Glover, and Mike Hopkins, and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Soichi Noguchi will also be flying. They'll be in the Crew-1 mission a little later this year. Of course, that's after Bob and Doug return home. Now, Crew-1 will be the second space flight for Walker and Hopkins, who each flew on the Russian Soyuz. And it will be the first space flight for Glover and the third space flight for Noguchi. He flew on both the space shuttle and the Soyuz previously. Now, the Crew-1 mission will be the first in a series of rotational flights to station after Demo-2, once NASA certifies the SpaceX systems for regular crew flights. And right now, Victor and Mike are following along from the Johnson Space Center in Houston, and they are standing by to talk to NASA's Daryl Na uh, Daryl Nail. Daryl, are you... All right, I'm sorry, we don't have Daryl, uh, but as we continue to follow the convoy, we've got actually a little chase car uh, following the convoy. I think we're going to be actually talking to Victor and Mike from right here. Uh, Victor and Mike, are you there? Uh, Victor and Mike, are you there? We are here. All right, hi, guys. I, well, I'm just going to ask you first. Uh, you're going to be two of the next people to get on board Crew Dragon, so what, what are all your thoughts and feelings as you're watching Bob and Doug in the Tesla right now? As you can imagine, uh, there's a lot of emotions. Uh, of course, we're excited, excited for Bob and Doug, excited for NASA, excited for SpaceX, and, and really the whole country. Uh, a lot of pride in, uh, in what it's taken to get to this moment, uh, all the thousands of people uh, that have contributed to getting to this moment. But then there's also a, a bit of sense of duty of, of business as usual. So for us, uh, we're going to be watching, we're going to be listening, we're going to be learning, um, and all of that to help get us prepared for when it's our turn. And your, your mission, are called Crew-1. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. I was just going to say it was also great to see them walk out just now and uh, say goodbye to their families and do the virtual hugs. Uh, that was great. There are a lot of emotions, but uh, that, that's uh, probably the best one. And Victor and Mike, I know recently you had uh, Shannon Walker and Suichi Noguchi um, also assigned to the Crew-1 mission with you. Um, what can you tell us about them and your relationship with them and your training so far with them? Yeah, you know, I'm very excited about uh, Crew-1. Uh, we've got a very experienced crew. You guys hit on that a little bit earlier. Of course, Shannon, she's been with NASA for around 30 years. Uh, she's uh, been with the astronaut office for more than 15 years, and of course, Soyuz long duration, so she's seen a lot around here. Suichi, uh, you know, with Jackson, he, he's done it all. 1996, when he first became an astronaut, shuttle, space station, short duration, long duration, spacewalks, you name it. And so, you know, we kind of uh, late in the game here had our, our full crew complement, and so it's really helped uh, getting uh, them in with all of that experience. It's, it's really streamlined the process for our. Uh, uh, becoming more cohesive as a crew. 
Yeah, you know, they, they really hit the ground running. We showed up uh, to our first Sims, and it felt like we had done it several times before. And so it's great because we do have a lot to get done. We not only have to learn to fly and to operate the Crew Dragon spacecraft that Bob and Doug are going to do later today, God willing. Uh, we also have to be ready to do all of the things that uh, a crew on board the space station does, the spacewalks, the research, the basic upkeep of the space station. And so we also have all that training going on as well. And that's what we've been doing for the past several months together. And now I have a specific question for Mike. Um, I know that you've flown on the Russian Soyuz um, and not specifically on space shuttle, but can you talk about the tradition of the ride out that we're seeing now? Yeah, the ride out, you know, it's, it's very symbolic. It's, it's symbolic of that transition, the transition from months and years of preparation to the actual execution of the mission itself. And, and so for the astronauts, for, for Bob and Doug right now, it gives them an opportunity to reflect on all of the work that it took to get to this moment, but then it also gives them time to focus on the job, to, to really mentally prepare for, for game day. And then when you think about DM2 and this particular mission, you know, that's this uh, symbolic of this transition from almost nine years where we have not had human launch capability in the U.S. to a new age of, of government and private partnerships that are going to be launching humans into low Earth orbit and beyond. And, and that's happening right here from the United States of America. And a question for Victor, because I know, you know, if all goes well, when you fly on uh, Crew-1 a little later this year, it's going to be your first trip to space. Can you put yourself in the, in the seat right now, in the car with Bob and Doug? I mean, walk me through what that's going to feel like for you, knowing you're headed to the launch pad, you're going to be launching into space for the very first time. You know, it, it, it'll be tough to, uh, or it is tough now to, to, to imagine what those feelings are going to be like. We were able to simulate that and run through a day of launch exercise and ride out in the Teslas to the launch pad, up the elevator, up the set of stairs, and out the crew arm to, to where the vehicle would be. And just that day was amazing to me. We were able to do it with the full convoy and to, to see what that would be like. And, and that was overwhelming after being a kid watching something similar to that on television. And so I can't imagine what it's going to feel like on our actual day. But I tell you what, I'm looking forward to it. And again, to go back to that moment where Bob and Doug got to say goodbye to their boys and Karen and Megan, I, I can't wait to see my kids uh, standing there. It's something that I look forward to. Uh, it's going to be great. Victor Glover, Mike Hopkins, thank you so much, and we can't wait to wish you well and cheer you along on that journey. Lauren? So, <laughs> that was so cool. Now, as you're watching this live from wherever you are, you can send a shout out to the crew with a like or a comment on Twitter or Instagram with the hashtag Launch America and be a part of this moment. So, Leland, I mean, uh, it looks like we're the, the convoy is headed past the vehicle assembly building. We're looking at the pad now. They've got uh, probably about three more miles to go at this point. But what do you think that is going through their minds right now? Well, you know, I was watching some video of Bob and Doug, the kind of the lighter side. And I would imagine that the two of them, they train so hard. They are meticulous at what they do. They might be telling jokes like we did when we were in the Astro van heading to Pad 39A. Um, you've been together for so long. You know the systems. You know exactly what you're doing. And it, we had a moment of, of levity where we would tell jokes. And we wouldn't even tell the whole joke. We would just say the number because we had <laughs> said it them so many times. And, you know, we were high-fiving. We were chest bumping. We were, you know, getting ready. Um, mentally, but it was that moment of just we've made all this preparation and now it's game day. And we're ready to get up in that vehicle and go to space. And we now we're going to go out to Hawthorne for the last leg of the convoy's trek to the launch pad. Dan? Hey, thanks, Marie. So at this point, the convoy is getting really close to pad 39A, and pretty soon they're going to be entering what's known as the BDA or the blast danger area. Before any pad technicians, engineers, or obviously our astronauts enter this area around the launch pad, SpaceX and NASA teams do some internal go-no-go -no -go polls just to make sure everything is clear. And you already saw people on the arm and the crews moving in, so everything is clear. This storied launch pad, which has been the beginning point for so many firsts, is the perfect backdrop for today's historic launch that marks a new first and a new era in human spaceflight. But with new vehicles being designed and launched, this launch pad required some major upgrades. 
That's right, and Daryl Nail is going to show us a couple of those upgrades at Pad 39A, where SpaceX completed a 21st century makeover to help launch us into the next chapter of human spaceflight. We're go, same time, we're go. Some say the moon. Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? That's 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, all three engines up and burning, 2, 1, 0, and liftoff, the final liftoff of Atlantis on the shoulders of the space shuttle, America will continue the dream. And you can see on your screen, Bob and Doug are getting very, very close to pad 39A. <laughs> In addition to these launch pad upgrades, SpaceX also made changes to both Falcon 9 and Dragon to enable flying crew. A key update to this latest version of Dragon is its highly reliable launch escape system that is capable of carrying crew to safety at any point during ascent of the rocket. Right. And I'm sorry, I'm just waiting for that pullback moment on the camera where we're going to see their cars roll right up to the pad. Another key upgrade, though, for everything today is Dragon's new life support system. As you can imagine, and oh, sorry, there we go, crew arriving at the pad. As you can imagine, flying humans requires keeping a habitable environment inside Dragon throughout the entire flight. And so that's everything like providing breathing air, keeping the capsule at a safe pressure, keeping it free of contaminants, removing carbon dioxide, regulating temperature and humidity, 
and implementing a waste collection system, a.k.a. the toilet. <laughs> the changes to Falcon 9 were small, but extremely meaningful to meet NASA's requirements for safety for human spaceflight. And specifically, SpaceX had to prove a high degree of fault tolerance, meaning that small failures in the system would not lead to mission failure. Falcon 9 was already able to handle engine failure, but new emphasis was put on making sure that a failure throughout any phase of launch would not mean mission failure. <laughs> and that's a really cool view on your screen with Bob and Doug getting out of their Teslas. That is amazing. <laughs> um, and this goes down all the way to latches, control valves, electronics, and wiring, and so much more to keep them safe. All right, well, with the astronauts now on location at Pad 39A, Marie, Lauren, Leland, take us through the crew making their final steps towards that Dragon spacecraft. All right, thanks, Dan. That was really cool to see. Uh, we, we can see the Teslas on the screen there. Uh, they're going to stop for Bob and Doug to take a little nature break uh, before they make their way up to the pad. And we're expecting it should be about T minus two hours and 55 minutes, so just under three minutes from now we should hear a formal announcement on the loops that the crew is on the pad. So we'll quiet down to listen for that um, when we get a little closer. But Lauren, you didn't get a chance to mention while they were driving out there, they have a very cool playlist they had on the way out, right? Yeah, I remember Bob uh, tweeting, what should I listen to on the, on the way out? So here's what they chose. The first is ACDC's Back in Black. Uh, I think he actually tweeted that one, or someone recommended it, which is super cool. Uh, and the reason being, they are back. Uh, then they also listened to the elevator music from the Blues Brothers film, that song, Girl from Inpanema. And Colin, <laughs> I believe so, yeah. Got another career. That in and uh, meatball loving, <laughs> uh, but the, sort of symbolizing the fact that they're waiting. And the third song was the Star Spangled Banner, nice. the Army French Horns version, um, mm. for very obvious reasons, that one. Yeah, I gotta set the mood, set the tone, right, Leland? You know all about tone, that. Little tone, a little meatball. <laughs> yeah. All good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't and make, Don't make me come over there, Lauren. <laughs> So we're looking now at the Crew Dragon capsule on top of the Falcon 9 rocket, the impressive crew access arm. Um, that's that black and white uh, kind of hallway you see there. That's how the crew make their way over to Crew Dragon to climb inside. And that uh, Falcon 9 rocket stands about 230 feet tall. Uh, the Crew Dragon trunk, uh, from the bottom of the trunk to the top of the nose cone, that's another 27 feet on top of that. So here in just a couple of minutes, Bob and Doug are going to be um, making their way up in an elevator. They don't have to climb the whole way. It's just uh, about 10 feet of stairs at the, at the last leg of that trip. And lots of people are uh, weighing in on social media. Uh, this person says it's happening, and I can't read the rest of it right now, but uh, lots, of, lots of people uh, really getting pumped using the hashtag Launch America online. Somebody says uh, they're watching live now and wishing us a fantastic launch. Oh, we certainly hope so. Last we heard was a 50-50 chance with the weather, so uh, it's going to be exciting. And it looks like, I'm not sure if that one is Bob or Doug in this one here. Can't tell from this, uh, from this view, but it looks like one of them is getting ready to get out of the Tesla in just a minute. Lauren, our suits from the, our pumpkin suits had different colors for what position, what mission position you have. Do these suits have colors to designate the two astronauts? Do you know? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but their names are on the suits. Maybe that helps. Well, we had <laughs> names too, but, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, if you're trying to find out what suit that you have, you know, I guess it's only two of them and it could be up to, but you'd be up to up seven. To Astronauts, though, right? Uh, uh, it's ca ca Dragon is capable of carrying seven, uh, but for NASA missions, it's four. It's just four, okay. Yes. There go those doors. I'm going to call them the DeLorean doors. Yes. Can I call them that? I, sure. I think that's, that's <laughs> totally fair game. Acknowledge the inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Again, we're looking at the, the base level there. And Leland, I know we talked about this. You know, you were out here last week, and we were talking about how the pad looks so different from the shuttle days. Uh, can you talk about what you remember and kind of how it's different now? Yeah, I mean, this the form and the function. I mean, this black pad with the white ticking, and, you know, it's, it's a really beautiful. You think about STEM education, but this is totally STEAM, science, technology, engineering, 
arts and mathematics. And I think, you know, SpaceX has done an incredible job of making things look really beautiful and functional and, and you know, everything just fits perfectly. And I, and I think, you know, when we were having our, our launch pad, there were hoses and things hanging off, but this is a very sleek and elegant and kind of futuristic look at the next era of space travel. And, um, you know, I, I, I just love seeing these Teslas versus the Astrovan. Are they doing selfies? <laughs> it's like they're trying to they're trying to strain to see the top of the crew dragon just taking in the sight. It's pretty high. <laughs> and I don't know if you if you caught this one. We we, we could see it briefly on the shot, but the uh, they, the license plate says ISS BND ISS bound. Oh, ah, you nice. follow? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully they will be today. We just need the weather to. Say, I mean, it looks pretty nice right now, right? But, I mean, obviously it's not just what the weather conditions are here. They've got to think about downrange in case of an abort, mm -hmm. um, make sure it's okay for recovery if we get into a situation like that, which is unlikely. So this elevator is going to take them up to level 255. It's not 255 floors, but that's 255 feet. And from there they'll take, once they get up there, and this elevator is pretty zippy, so they'll get up there pretty quickly, um, they'll get out and they'll walk up another flight of stairs to level 265, and that's where they will greet the crew arm. And I don't know, well, obviously Leland's been in the elevator. Lauren, I'm pretty sure you've been out there too, but the first time I rode in the elevator, I was like, whoa, we're really moving in this. <laughs> Pull some cheese. <laughs> A little bit of a jolt when, when it first goes. Yeah, you get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> And then the jolt is a little bit more extreme when you get in the rocket and take off. So. <laughs> just, a little, just a little primer. It's a primer. The doors are opening. And here they come. It's a beautiful view up there, too, of the, you know, all of the surroundings in Florida and this national wildlife uh, retreat that we have here, but getting ready for the business at hand of getting in the rocket and uh, heading to the cosmos. And those are the stairs uh, Lauren mentioned. They're at the two, it's the 255 foot level right now. Yes. I think I said that right. And now they're headed up the stairs to the 265 foot level. That's the level that will take them to where the, the crew access arm is in the white room. Yeah, that's the view right there that they're looking at. And Lauren, what are those chevrons, those white chevrons on the on the floor? What do they lead to? Those are basically highlighting the exit path. So in the event that they needed to, that anyone up there needed to get away ASAP, they follow those arrows to where escape baskets await them. There's seven baskets, and they'll hop in there, and it's kind of like a zip line. Mm -hmm. They'll slide all the way down from that uh, fixed service structure down to the ground safe and away from the rocket. Great. And at the top right of your screen where you see them, there's actually a phone right up there next to the worm. There's the worm again, Leland. Uh, but there's I'm okay a phone. With that. I'm okay with that now. <laughs> okay. it, it really pops up there. Yeah, it's like it belongs there or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny, isn't it? Um, Leland, tell us about the phone. What's the significance of the phone up there? Yeah, I mean, you can call family members that you maybe weren't able to come to the launch. And in this case, there are quite a few of them. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a last minute to say goodbye and say that you're going to talk to them when you get to space. Absolutely. And, again, they're just kind of taken in the sights before they go into the white room, and the pad team is there. You can see them. They're in, they're in black with the white numbers on their back. They're all members of the pad team. They're going to be helping them um, when they get into um, ingress. Um, actually, at about – we're at T – uh, T minus two hours and 50 minutes right now at about T minus two hours and 35 minutes. So just under 15 minutes from now is when the astronauts will ingress. That's the term we use for climbing into Dragon. And, of course, they will have the assistance of the suit techs and get buckled in. And so we want to head over to Hawthorne now for a preview of what's in store for not just Bob and Doug, but future space travelers. 
Shortly after we begin to regularly fly NASA astronauts to and from the space station, SpaceX will also begin flying private passenger passengers to station and beyond using Dragon. That's right. NASA is going to be enabling up to two private astronaut missions to visit the space station each year, just as part of our support of a broader economy in low Earth orbit. It's just one of the many ways NASA is opening access for companies to manufacture products in microgravity, for new commercial modules in space, and to enable more people to be able to explore the stars firsthand. And the more people out there exploring the stars, the closer we get to becoming a multi-planetary species. Earlier we showed you a first-hand look at where you would train if you were to fly with us on board Dragon, but now let's take a peek inside the spacecraft itself. When we wanted to take Dragon and make it human rated, I think we took a, a different approach to spaceship design than has previously been done because we wanted this to feel like a 21st century spaceship. We wanted it to inspire another generation of, of astronauts. Really everything when you look at Dragon was driven by function. We took into account Everything from the placement of all the cargo supplies to the light rail on the top doubled as a handhold. Probably one of the, the biggest features of Dragon are the touch screens on the inside. We designed them not just to be very functional, but, but with a user experience in mind, it's very intuitive to know what we need to do at any given moment in time. When I think about comfort for the astronauts, it's, it's really every aspect of how you could interact with the spaceship that comes to mind. We have three different seat sizes. We even go so far as molding the foam around the astronaut's body so that there's not any pressure points and it's just generally a pleasurable journey to space. Dragon is a spaceship that's all about safety and reliability. We designed it to be two fault tolerant, which means that any two things could fail. So I could lose a flight computer and a thruster and I could still bring the crew back home safely. We also added a launch escape system. If anything goes wrong on a sense that the crew can get away from Falcon and get picked up safely. I've worked on Dragon since, since 2012. When I see Dragon lift off, I think I'm going to feel a buildup of emotion of eight years of working with some of the best engineers and technicians across the country that, that put their heart and mind into making this incredible moment happen for, for everybody. You guys have started on schedule. Um, we see them signing, looks like they're signing something in there right now. Yeah, we give them a black Sharpie to sign the white room. It's starting a new tradition. Hmm. Yeah, we didn't do that. That's nice. <laughs> That's awesome. It's a good tradition. Yeah. And while we were in the video, we saw Bob and Doug walk down the crew access arm. Leland, it's like that, you know, futuristic look that you talked about. I mean, what did you think seeing that and how that kind of compare and contrast what that was like during shuttle? You know, it's really, it's really beautiful, I think. I mean, you know, back when when I was flying on shuttle, the everything looked, oh, look at the thumbs up from Bob. He's, uh, he's getting excited. There's a few little photos at the end there. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a just a totally different era. I mean, the SpaceX team is really looking to make something futuristic. It's make, looking like, uh, you know, something from the George Jetsons or from other other movies that you've seen on television and uh, at the movies. And I think it's something that inspires our country and inspires our children, especially, to see that they want to be these astronauts. They want to study hard and be that next generation of explorers launching from Cape Canaveral in a SpaceX rocket, um, you know, or working for NASA, working for SpaceX or any of the other uh, companies that are trying to get off planet and I and I think that you know this this change in the way that we're doing business is going to be a really great way of getting more people to the table to fly in space yeah that was really important to us dragon we see it as a 21st century spaceship it needs to look like a 21st century spaceship it flies like a 21st century spaceship so of course of course the ground support equipment should look like it's from the same era the suits do mm -hmm. um, all of that sort of future facing technology and aesthetic is super important to us. Uh, actually, right now, you can see that duct in uh, the, the hands of member number five there. Um, that is an ECS duct, or environmental control system duct. Um, once this original, oh, did one just, who just went in? Was that Doug or Bob? 
I think that was Doug. Okay. Doug that was Doug. Yeah. That is awesome. He's ahead of schedule. Somebody <laughs> tell him to climb back they out. <laughs> booking. It is great. He's ready. He's like <laughs> Leland. We, we were joking earlier about it. We were going to have to buckle Leland into his seat here to keep him from running out there. Yeah, if we had stayed outside, I was going to swim across the moat and <laughs> run over and get in the, in the vehicle with Bob and Doug. Right, but, uh, now Bob's going in. Yeah. This is great. So the suit technicians are helping the crew climb inside. Uh, they're holding back the hatch seals to protect the, the seals on the hatch, but also making sure that the crew doesn't hit their head or anything on the way in. Even though they have helmets, we still don't want that to happen. And, you know, they, they climbed in a couple minutes earlier than we expected them to, but... You know, Lauren, that, you know, SpaceX has rehearsed this over and over and over again with Bob and Doug. And, you know, sometimes and, and I've heard them say, you know, well, we might be a little bit ahead of schedule if we're ready. It just gives them more time <laughs> to check things out, you know. Yeah. So right now what the crew, the, the suit technicians are doing is they're strapping the crew's feet into these restraints that the boots sit inside of. They're then going to close those five point harnesses um, around them. I know, Leland, you talked about some of the, the harnessing that you had in the past with the shuttle. Yeah, I mean, this is such a more sleek design where there's one point to plug in to get cooling, communications, and, and everything. And, I, you know, we had a five-point harness. We, you know, had these hoses and things all over the place. But I think this is a much more streamlined uh, look into the future of space travel. Yeah, and similar to what was going in the ONC building during the suit checkouts, that seat umbilical is going to connect to the right thigh uh, of the spacesuit. Um, there is a fluid module that is connected to the spacesuit, and that provides fresh cooling air and also nitrox for the leak checks that are going to come up later. But the audio system is also going through that umbilical. Mm -hmm. So um, while the crew is, or while the, the uh, suit techs are getting the crew all, all buckled in, um, they're going to perform a comm check. And that's, again, similar to what was done at the ONC building, but this time the integrated two-way communications between the astronauts and the ground crew. And we're going to head back to Hawthorne now, as we just saw Bob and Doug ingress Crew Dragon. Dan? Hey, thanks. Yeah, it's it's incredible to see them inside the capsule. If you're just now tuning in, great timing. You're watching our coverage of the mission known as Demonstration Mission 2 or Demo 2. Today, SpaceX and NASA are going to be sending people into orbit on a mission to the International Space Station for the first time from U.S. soil since 2011. Bob Banken and Doug Hurley are those astronauts flying in Dragon. They're inside. That's uh, Doug Hurley really close to our screen and Bob Banken on the further seat away from us. And they are getting ready to lift off from pad 39A where Falcon 9 will lift off around or at 4.33 p.m. Eastern time. They already ascended the tall structure next to the rocket, which is called the fixed service structure, and walked down the corridor known as the crew arm. And now they're already boarded inside of Dragon. Yeah, right before they got in, we did see them pause for a moment and actually sign the wall. They were in the white room, and the white room is just literally that room at the end of the crew arm that has an opening into Dragon. It's the last place on planet Earth where Bob and Doug are standing before they get into Dragon for their ride to the space station. And the term the white room was first used during NASA Gemini missions where the room right before entering into the spaceship was painted white. So we've continued the tradition with painting ours white as well and also started a new tradition. If you just saw, they did sign the white room wall, which is really, really awesome. It's a fairly small area that has room for the crew and a few ground support members to complete cargo load at T minus 24 hours and crew ingress at T minus 2 hours and 35 minutes. And ingress is how we refer to the crew boarding dragon. And inside the white room, there's also a movable platform that just gets extended out to the capsule just in order to bridge that gap between the crew arm and the dragon side hatch, just allowing easy entry into dragon. And as you might expect, the entire area is environmentally controlled just so the dragon side hatch can be kept open while we're keeping all of that dust, dirt, Florida humidity out of the capsule, making sure it's pristine for the crew. There's also a big seal that's inflated and compressed against the capsule right now just to help maintain that clean environment. 
The White Room also has lots of tools in order to open the side hatch, complete crew ingress as they're doing right now, and prepare for any contingency or emergency that may be encountered. And so as we just heard from Lauren and Marie and the team, they're getting into this capsule now. They're getting their seats connected to their suits via that umbilical that's going to give them hard line connections into audio for their comm checks, which are going to be coming up shortly. And again, breathing gas and pressurized nitrox for those suit leak checks. So this will be the second time since getting suited up that they've done these leak checks. We're just kind of all about redundancy and constantly checking our systems as we continue to count down. But I mean, there they are. Right now, we're watching Bob and Doug getting into Dragon, getting strapped in. Uh, before they connected their suits to the actual seats, they did something called a foreign object debris check or a FOD check. And that just means that they actually get inspected for any substance or debris on their suit that could interfere with those systems on Dragon. And to help protect against debris, the crew has covers on their boots as well as their umbilical part on their suits that need to be removed before they can ingress. So they've already removed those. And as you can see, they are getting strapped in. And once the FOD check is complete, our commander, Doug Hurley, um, entered first. And then Bob Bankin followed after him. And they're getting buckled in right now, as you can see on your screen, and attaching their umbilicals to their, their suits. The umbilicals allow the crew to have comms through their suit and air to help keep them cool, as well as delivers nitrox for suit pressurization. And as we mentioned earlier in the broadcast, the suit's primary function is to protect the crew in the event of a cabin depressurization. And just walking through the interior a little bit, there are four seats configured inside Dragon right now. They're numbered one to four from right to left when you're looking at the seats. So we've had a couple of camera views just from the hatchway. So in the right white room, if you're looking at that angle, you go from one to four right to left. Doug Hurley is in seat two or the commander seat. Bob Bankin is in seat three, which is on Crew Dragon is the pilot seat. And then obviously nobody is in seats one and four today. A Crew Dragon is designed to carry four astronauts on these future NASA missions. And we met two of the Crew One members um, and heard about their other two crew members a little bit earlier. Directly in front of both of our crew members today are three touchscreen displays that they're going to use throughout the flight, giving them insight into Dragon systems, seeing any alerts or issues with the vehicle, and if required, taking control and manually flying Dragon. We can see Doug Hurley manipulating those displays right now. And coming up, the crew will do a comm check to make sure that they can hear mission control and their seats will be rotated into position for launch so that they can see those display panels right in front of them. So now let's check in with John Insprecker for the latest on the health of both vehicles. Over to you, John. We're at T-minus 2 hours, 36 minutes, 30 seconds in the countdown for the launch of Falcon 9 with Dragon to the space station. The Dragon Launch Ops team has completed their major activities to prepare the spacecraft for the astronauts. Checkouts are complete of major systems, including the escape system. And as you can see, ingress of the astronauts well underway. They're hooking their suits up to the various cabin systems. Right now on Dragon, there are no issues in work. Comm checks will be coming up shortly on the Dragon spacecraft with the crew. We might be able to hear some of that, and we'll bring it to you as it happens. Now currently the Falcon 9 team is preparing for their final checkouts and propellant load. Checkouts are due to begin at T-minus two hours. That's when the majority of the launch crew will actually get on console officially in Fire Room 4 at Kennedy Space Center. Currently on Falcon 9, all systems are go. The Air Force range continues to report no problems with air and sea space clearance. Everything's looking good. Roadblocks are up around the launch pads. The weather forecast continues to be acceptable, but something we're going to watch all the way through. We're not only looking at weather at the launch site, but we are looking around the world. We need to make sure conditions are acceptable if Dragon has to splash down in the Atlantic in case of an escape. We're also monitoring contingency splashdown locations if the crew had to come back to Earth before docking with the space station. Right now, those conditions are getting better as we go through the day at the launch pad things continue to be a 60% probability of violating the conditions or 40% chance if you're an optimist of good weather. But right now the clock is continuing to count down. All systems are go. We're just inside T minus two minutes, 35, two hours, 35 minutes. 
All right, now as Bob and Doug finish their ingress procedures and get comfortable inside Dragon, we're going to continue to listen for those comms checks. They should be coming up in just a little bit. But right now I'm joined now by SpaceX's Jessica Jensen and Lars Blackmore just to discuss a little bit more about what make Dragon and Falcon 9 a 21st century launch vehicle. So first off, thank you so much for joining me today. Jessica, I'll start with you. Yeah. Walk me through kind of Dragon's life history and how we got to where we are today. Sure. So Dragon was designed from scratch 12 years ago by SpaceX. It was designed to carry cargo to and from the International Space Station. Um, and what that means is 12 years ago wasn't that long ago. So we got to use state-of-the-art materials, um, state-of-the-art you know, computer processors. So really, Dragon, to start off with, is already a modern advanced spacecraft. But then there's two other parts of it also that really led to commercial crew. Um, one part of it was that we actually were able to man rate Cargo Dragon uh, while it's in the vicinity of the space station and attached to the space station. So that was a huge learning curve for we human rated a spacecraft um, for a portion of the mission and then for crew you just have to obviously expand it for the whole mission. Um, and then the last part was Cargo Dragon has been this amazing test bed for commercial crew. And what that means is we were able to test out like heat shield materials and parachute materials on Cargo Dragon before they ever flew on Crew Dragon. Very cool. And that's just one part of the equation. Lars, walk us through, again, just the flight history of Falcon 9 from the humble beginnings to where we are today. Well, Falcon 9 first flew almost 10 years ago today. And even though the first version of that rocket couldn't carry humans, the fundamental design was made with that goal in mind. Over the course of 87 launches, we've steadily improved the rocket so that now it has twice the payload to orbit that we started out with. We can land and reuse the first stage in the fairing. And most importantly for today, we have the reliability that we need for humans. Now, what's interesting is that that reliability has come from steady upgrades and almost a decade of flight experience. But it's actually quite hard to prove reliability. This is something that the commercial airline industry has been grappling with for decades. And just like them, we rely on lots and lots of testing. So for instance, if you take the Merlin 1D engine, that has to fly for about six minutes continuously to get to orbit. We took one of those and ran it for more than 250 minutes to get the statistical proof of reliability that we need. So it's that testing and lots and lots of analysis that gives us and NASA the confidence that Falcon is ready to fly humans for the first time. And obviously a lot of additional upgrades, a lot of additional testing had to go just to make sure that both of these vehicles were human rated. So walk us through some of the specific upgrades to Dragon to meet that criteria. Yep. So um, the first one's pretty obvious. You had a, we had a cargo Dragon. It has lots of cargo cubbies. So we took all of those out, replaced it with astronaut seats, crew displays, and crew controls. But one thing that people may not know is on Cargo Dragon, we've actually been flying mice to and from the International Space Station for years. And what that meant was we had to design an environmental control and life support system for Dragon years ago. Um, it provides oxygen, it scrubs carbon dioxide, and among other things, controls temperature and relative humidity. So even though that was done on a smaller scale for mice, it was a great learning curve on how to help man rate a spacecraft when you have to do it for humans. And then, Lars, same question. What kind of specific upgrades had to go into it to certify Falcon 9 for this day? Well, I already mentioned the reliability upgrades. One upgrade that I think is particularly interesting is the launch abort trigger. So people probably know that Dragon has the ability in mid-flight to separate from Falcon and boost the astronauts away to safety in the case that there's some kind of emergency. And that could be triggered by the astronauts or by the ground crew. What people may not know is that Falcon itself has the ability to cause that trigger. And it will do that entirely autonomously using algorithms, software, and sensors. And that's particularly important in the case Dragon. of a time critical fault where yeah, aborting quickly means aborting safely. And uh, in some cases, Falcon can do this quicker than three tenths of a second, so much faster than a human. And Lars, I'm gonna pause right there for a sec. We're getting some calm from the crew. And so coming up shortly, we're going to hear these communication checks. Bob and Doug are going to be talking to several positions down on the ground, and they're going to be using both communication speakers inside of Dragon and inside their suits in a series of communications checks. 
They're also going to be doing these checks over different satellites CDR, and ground stations. CDR, PLT, comm check, umbilical. CDR, loud and clear. PLT, loud and clear. Core, loud and clear. Umbilical, comm check complete. Stand by for ground station comm check. And you'll hear him refer to CDR as Doug Hurley. That's the commander, PLT pilot. That's Bob Bankin. And so that first one we heard was through the umbilical. So that communication link directly into their suit. Now they're going to do a communication check over the ground stations. We'll also hear one over TDRS. That's the tracking and data relay satellites. Same satellites we use to talk to the International Space Station. That's what we'll be using to talk and track Dragon throughout its entire flight. So again, just waiting for a moment for the teams to continue configuring everything. They're going to do these ground checkouts now, and you're going to be hearing them talk directly to the core. It's the crew operations responsible engineer. That's essentially the Capcom if you followed NASA missions in the past. It's a position right here in Hawthorne at SpaceX Mission Control, which is just a few feet away from us, where the team's going to be watching over Bob and Doug for their entire flight. That's where the main person whose job it is to talk to them is going to be sitting. We'll also hear them do some checkouts with the launch director uh, down there at the Cape inside firing room four. And you'll be hearing those very characteristic beeps. SpaceX Dragon, weak but readable. Copy, we have you the same. Uh, stand by, we're still configuring for ground station contact. Dragon, copy. And just to further explain some of those voice protocols that you're going to hear, uh, you might be used to hearing Houston Station or Houston Shuttle or Houston Endeavor back when we were flying those specific shuttles. You're going to hear SpaceX Dragon. That's the SpaceX team calling the Dragon team on orbit. And then Bob and Doug will be able to respond. And so they're going to continue to configure. We'll get these ground station checkouts momentarily. And just a reminder, you're going to hear that very, very unique beeping sound. That's called a Quindar. And that's been something that's been used throughout space to ground or air to ground communications throughout spaceflight history. And that's really just for teams who are in mission control or supporting the launch know when you hear that sound, it's time to listen. Dragon, SpaceX, comm check, ground station. Dragon, as you're loud and clear, much better, Jay. And core, loud and clear, ground station, comm check complete. Stand by for Tedris, comm check. Dragon, SpaceX, comm check, Tedris. SpaceX, Dragon, loud and clear. Core, loud and clear. Tedris, comm check complete. Stand by for checks with MD, LD in the launch configuration. Dragon, MD on countdown one, comm check. Jason, we've got you loud and clear. How you doing? Doing great. How are you guys doing in there? Stand by for comm checks. Are they launch a spaceship? Agree. And stand by for comm checks over Dragon to ground. Dragon, MD on Dragon to ground, comm check. Loud and clear. MD, loud and clear. Stand by for comm checks with LD. Dragon, launch director on countdown one, comm check. 
Mike, we've got you loud and clear. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Let me try on uh, Dragon to Ground 1. Dragon, SpaceX launch director on Dragon to Ground 1, comp check. Loud and clear. Have you the same? Dragon SpaceX, launch configuration comp checks are complete. Report when ready for seat rotation for section 2 of 4.100. SpaceX Dragon, we're ready for seat rotation. Copy, ready for seat rotation. We will report when initiating. All right, so that wraps up those communications checks. Everything going good with the spacecraft, Bob and Doug talking to the teams on the ground. Pretty soon they're going to get their seats rotated. Bringing you back inside Hawthorne real quick, I do want to thank Jessica and Lars for joining me real quick, giving us that great insight into Dragon and Falcon 9. Hope you guys got a good spot staked out to watch a launch today. Great to have you on. Absolutely. Super All right. Excited. So we're going to throw it now down to Gary Jordan at Mission Control Houston, who I know is also following along. Over to you, Gary. Thanks, Dan. Great to hear good checks from Bob and Doug in the Dragon vehicle. Here in Mission Control Houston, Flight Director Zeb Scoville has pulled Space Station flight controllers, and all systems are go for launch. Essentially, the station is prepared for Dragon to arrive 19 hours after launch. Flight controllers here will continue to monitor the countdown, but really it's up to the teams in Kennedy and Hawthorne to get us to lift off at this point. So we want to hear your comments as we continue to count down to launch. So let's go to the social desk now, Tahira. Thanks, Gary. So taking a quick look, so taking a quick look at those numbers right now, there are now uh, 1 million people watching our coverage and Launch America is up to the number one trending hashtag on Twitter. So let's take a closer look at what's being said online. Okay, so right now we have Art Alexandria, and it looks like she's got a personal self-portrait, cosmic for sure, in her NASA flight suit. And guys, this is what I'm loving seeing online with this hashtag, is how everyone around the nation is making this launch uniquely theirs. And I want to point out one line in her post that says, I believe that no matter how far the future is, we are on our way towards it. And guys, I couldn't have said it better myself. That's what today represents. Let's take another look. Oh my goodness. Okay, so right now we have Jessica with her space pup getting ready for liftoff. And guys, I'm not gonna lie, we love to see it. So please, if you have any space pets, comment using hashtag Launch America. As you can see, everybody is thrilled to be a part of this launch today. And I know of one special guest in particular. I'm so pleased to welcome Diana Coart of Physics Girl. Diana, I hear you have a, very, have a burning question for Mission Control, so go for it. Hi, Tahira. Thank you so much for including me on this incredibly special day. I'm Diana from the YouTube channel Physics Girl, and I've always been so fascinated by space and especially space exploration because we bring together so many people for such a complicated task to send a rocket up into space. So my question is along the lines of what goes into a mission like that? What we all know, I think we're familiar with how much preparation and training astronauts have to do, but preparing for a mission like this and maybe preparing in the future for a mission to the moon or to Mars, what kinds of things do the, does the whole team have to do in order to prepare to launch a rocket? So Diana, that is such a great question because I mean, sometimes it, I think it does get overlooked what all goes into making a moment like this happen. So Gary, what has the team there in Mission Control been doing to prepare for this historic launch? Thanks Tahira and Diana, that's a fantastic question. Really, the operations here are not just starting today. There has been a lot of training and a lot of simulations that have been going into preparing for this moment. Uh, really preparing and getting everyone familiarized with every step of the mission from launch all the way through docking and throwing different scenarios them uh, at them just in case uh, something were to happen 
Every flight controller you see behind me will be prepared to respond effectively. Now, I do want to sh make a shout out that it's not just the flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston that have dedicated so much time to this launch. In fact, uh, I've been talking to Zeb Scoville, the flight director here in Mission Control Houston, who said that even before he was a flight director back in 2014, they were working on some of the operations for commercial crew missions. But really, this team expands across the country. You've already seen a lot of people working in Hawthorne, in Florida, in Houston, and really it takes an integrated and dedicated team to make a mission like this possible. Diana, thank you so much for the question. And really thanks to everyone sending in questions and for sharing in this historic mission today. Remember as you're hosting to use the hashtag Launch America. I do want to make a shout out to uh, the flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston. In fact, uh, some traditional flowers have been sent to Mission Control Houston. Uh, this dates even uh, back before the shuttle days for every mission to uh, dedicate it to the operations and the controllers here who are working so closely uh, and, and are integrated in every part of the mission. Uh, but, but now let's head over to Hawthorne for the latest status on the crew and on Dragon. Dan. All right, thank you, Gary. As you can see, Bob and Doug in a little bit different position now. Their suits have been rotated to the launch position. So this just puts their backs a little bit more horizontal with the ground itself, or parallel with the ground itself, and places those displays directly in front of them. We've also already moved into suit leak checks, so this is the second time they've had these leak checks done in their suit. So pressurized nitrox now flowing into those launch and entry suits that they're gonna be wearing throughout the dynamic phases of this mission. So right now we are under two, hour, two hours and 20 minutes from launch. We're about two hours and 18 minutes and counting from liftoff of the Falcon 9 from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It's going to be carrying our NASA crew members today, Doug Hurley and Bob Bankin aboard SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft. It's been a really exciting day so far. We're fighting against that weather, but we're continuing to press on for launch. The crew has been up since about 6 a.m. as they prepare to head to the International Space Station for part of this Demo 2 mission for NASA. And as you can see on your screen, it looks like they're just waiting and getting ready for this mission today. It's been such an exciting day so far. Again, as Dan said, their seats are rotated into launch position so that they can see those screens that you see there on the left side right in front of them. Their suit leak checks have been complete. Their comm checks are complete. So let's throw it over to Lauren in KSC. All right, uh, so Dragon Hatch Close is expected at T minus one hour and 55 minutes, and we are just pretty close to that. It's uh, getting really, really close. So this is one of the key, vis the final key visual milestones on that timeline to lift off, the closure of that hatch and locking Bob and Doug inside. Now, we have a couple of special guests joining us with Daryl at the OSB2 viewing location. That's NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine and SpaceX Chief Engineer Elon Musk. Daryl? That's right, Lauren. We're here on the fifth floor. We were supposed to be outside on the balcony overlooking uh, pad 39A, but we have come indoors due to the weather. But uh, we are here with two titans of space. And though it might look uh, like this is a reunion of a 90s boy band, it is not. <laughs> we are socially distanced uh, for, for good reason. Um, but we are here to talk about space. And I want to thank you both and tell you both it's a privilege and honor to be with you today. Um, we're going to start off with you, Jim, and ask you a couple questions here. I want to, I want to ask you, first of all, it's been almost three years that you were sworn in as NASA Administrator, and you knew from the very first day that you would be right here at the Kennedy Space Center in this moment when a commercial partner was ready to launch. Tell me what it's like to be leading NASA at this very moment. So I, I want to be clear. Um, I did not know that when I got sworn in. Um, I, I will tell you, um, uh, a lot of folks said it couldn't be done. Um, but of course, uh, as soon as I got the job, Elon and I have had a number of conversations. Elon committed that, that this was something that SpaceX could achieve. Um, we've had challenges. We've had setbacks. Uh, we've seen catastrophic losses of capsules and challenges with parachutes. On What's that? On the ground. On the ground, uncrewed. I want to be really clear. <laughs> Tests, but, but that's what's unique about SpaceX. SpaceX can do things that NASA historically has not done. They test, they fail, they fix, 
they fly, they test, they fail, they fix, they fly, until the point where we are today, where not only is SpaceX comfortable, but NASA is comfortable, we, we are ready to go. Um, but if you would have told me even two years ago we'd be right here, um, I might have even been questioning it then. Um, but this is, a, this is a monumental achievement. It's a Herculean task uh, by the SpaceX team, which we're very grateful for, and also by the NASA team um, that has been working hand in glove with them to get to this point. And it's good we have Jim and Elon both here to fact check each other, so that's good. <laughs> Thank you for that. Elon, in 2002, when you started SpaceX, um, many in the aerospace industry didn't take SpaceX seriously. You remember what that felt like. Yet here you are, you just sent two astronauts in a car made by your car company to launch pad 39A with uh, a spacecraft made by your space company. Yeah. And now they're launching the International Space Station. So I'm wondering for you in this moment, do you just pinch yourself thinking, yes. is this really happening? Uh, this is a dream come true, I think for me and everyone at, at SpaceX. This is uh, not something that I ever thought would actually happen. So when starting SpaceX in 2002, I really did not think this day would occur. I, I, I expected 90% chance we'd fail to even get to low Earth orbit with a small rocket. So somebody told me in 2002 that I'd be standing here with the NASA administrator, me and the astronauts, and the, the, we've got a rocket and spacecraft on pad 39A, the best pad in the world, uh, which is it's an honor to be there. I would have thought, man, I don't know what you're talking about, it's not <laughs> like like no way, no way is that true, uh, you know. And, and so it, it it is. Say it's even a dream come true. I didn't even dream that this would come true. Let me put it that way, you know. Uh, but it is. I, I am incredibly excited to be here um, on, on behalf of the SpaceX team. Um, and uh, as as Jim said, I just this really is the culmination of an of, in, of an incredible amount of work by the SpaceX team, uh, by by NASA, and by a number of, of other partners in in the process of making this happen. It's really, you can look at this as the results of, of, of 100,000 people, roughly, when you add up all suppliers and everyone, working incredibly hard to get to, to make this day happen. So it's, uh, so it's hard, really hard to believe that this is real. And you're here, and yeah. it's amazing, and many of us have been amazed as we've watched you accomplish these things over the years. Uh, Jim, back to you. This is all about the commercialization of space, and so, in the early going for commercial crew program, it wasn't something NASA was used to. Uh, you know, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, shuttle. Uh, NASA gave the designs and the contractors went out there and built it. This is different. It is. They're, they're building it now. What were some of the hurdles that you had to overcome to get to this point? Well, I think getting people to recognize that when the government provides both the demand and the supply, um, you're limited in what you're able to do. Um, and of course, back when this program was initiated under uh, Charlie Bolden, General Charlie Bolden, astronaut Charlie Bolden, um, Congress was not, was not supportive um, and did not provide the proper funding. Um, and yet he, he, he persevered, he pushed forward. Um, and, and now I think everybody recognizes we have to commercialize space. We've had success now with commercial resupply of the International Space Station. Now we've got commercial crew to the International Space Station. Eventually we need commercial space stations. So what we're using the International Space Station for right now, we're proving that we can compound uh, pharmaceuticals in a way that you cannot do on Earth. We're able to create immunizations in a way you cannot do on Earth. We're printing human organs in 3D. Right now it's just tissue, but eventually we're gonna print human organs in 3D using adult stem cells, your skin cells, your own DNA. It's gonna transform how we do medicine here on Earth, we're, we're creating advanced materials that you can only create in the microgravity of space, things like a, an, an artificial retina for the human eye. So if you have macular degeneration, you don't have to lose your eyesight. Bottom line is this, these markets are the future. And, and when, they, when they materialize, and they are materializing because of the work of NASA, we're gonna see capital investment, not just into launch, but also into habitation. Um, and that ultimately is what's gonna be transformational for commercial space. Very good, and Elon, in getting all of that going, the ISS and all the activity that takes place on board, it's key that this Crew Dragon operate on a regular basis. As the chief engineer, yes. what were some of the biggest hurdles you had to overcome to get your spacecraft ready to fly this mission? Well, the, the, the spacecraft and the rocket have gone through literally thousands and thousands of tests and reviews, uh, both uh, by SpaceX, by NASA, by third parties, 
Um, we've also, as Jim was alluding to, uh, we've, we've done a, a lot of flights. So uh, the, one, one of the things I think that's very helpful about this flight, about, about what we're about to do, is that the rocket has flown many times. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, even in this, uh, essentially this configuration, it's flown about 20 times. Mm -hmm. So that, that means we've, we really have, and I don't want to tempt fate, but a, a well-proven rocket. Um, and we've, we've flown uh, Crew Dragon to the space station once, successfully brought it back. Um, we've done a tremendous amount of testing on the ground. And when we do the testing on the ground, you always push the limits. Mm -hmm. So you want to try, th you, you push it way beyond what you'd expect in flight. So sometimes you actually, you break it because you kind of want to break it on the ground during testing to see what the limits are. Mm -hmm. So this is a result like, sort of, of thousands of tests, of thousands of design hours, and, and a tremendous number of smart people working um, incredibly hard to make this day happen. Um, and you've got two astronauts on board now. Yes. Do, you, do you feel that responsibility? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I felt it, I, th I think, most strongly when I saw their, their family just before coming here. And did you say anything that you can share? So we've done everything we can to make sure your dad's come back okay. Thanks for sharing that with us. Jim, you had some words with uh, the astronauts. Uh, what was your take on how they were feeling? I, I will tell you, um, you know, Doug Hurley, uh, Marine Corps test pilot, of course, a veteran of multiple space shuttle missions, Bob Benkin, uh, flight test engineer, United States Air Force, again, veteran of multiple space shuttle missions. This is not new to these guys. Um, uh, you know, all I could do is convey to them how, how much all of America appreciates what they're doing. Um, that the entire world is watching, um, and just how grateful we are uh, as a nation. And um, I will tell you, their demeanor is loose. They are ready to go. They were they're joking they're around. The they're talking, uh, talking <laughs> they really about do. what they have cool for guys. breakfast and yeah. how it might come uh, up later. It was uh, <laughs> shaking it was, eggs. Yeah, yeah right, I saw that. Yeah. Right. So it was, uh, it was nice to see they are, they are in their element, and, and we are just so grateful and proud of them. Well, that's good to hear. That gives you great confidence, I'm sure. Uh, and your positions as you as you hear that. We're going to go to a social media question, and we've got uh, this question coming from Brooklyn, and she wants to know, I noticed some changes in the crew spacesuits. They look much thinner and lighter. What changes in the space capsule allow to have these futuristic suits? Well, we spent a lot of time designing the, the spacesuit. I personally spent a lot of time uh, on, the, on the spacesuits. It took us uh, three, almost four years uh, to design suits that both look good and work well. Um, so you can see a, a spacesuit in the movie, looks good, doesn't work. <laughs> and, and then you can make a spacesuit that works but doesn't, doesn't look good. Um, because fundamentally it's a pressure suit that's got to survive in vacuum. Right. So um, it's, uh, you know, so it tends to puff up, you know, when, when it's under pressure and, and it's got to withhold, it's got to handle all that pressure. So uh, it took us many iterations to, to get the get the suit to we really want it to, to look great. Fundamentally, fundamentally what it's about is like we, we, we want to inspire kids to say that, that one day they want to wear that uniform. They want to, want, they want to wear that spacesuit mm -hmm. um, and get them fired up about, yeah, I want to be an astronaut. I want to, be, I want to work on aerospace engineering. I want to advance space flight. And I think what, the, what today is about is, is reigniting the dream of space and getting, getting people fired up about the future and excited. It's just one of those things that I think everyone uh, of, of, you know, from all walks of life, from all parts of the political spectrum, in the United States and elsewhere, should be really excited that this is a thing that is made by humans, for humans, and it, it, it's just a, a great, exciting, inspiring day, and it's one of, those, like, one of those things that makes you glad to wake up in the morning. Yeah, yeah. You know? Functional and inspiring. And there's one on a model right over there, and I'm, you, you got me so excited. I might run over there and put that thing on, Elon. Yeah. Um, no. They're kind of custom tailored, by the way. So, oh, they are. So that, so it's not I, I think you won't fit in that one, but we could make one there that you would put in. Well, I appreciate you. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate you saying <laughs> that. Yeah, because I'm six foot eight, so I, yeah, yeah. you have to do a lot of sewing. Well, and should the, the, the dragons, the dragon spacecraft is, uh -huh. uh, can take you can take someone who's six foot eight. My size. Yes. This commercial thing, I'm getting excited. Yes. Yeah. I'm ready to fly, Jim. Yeah. Sir. Um, we've got another social media question we're going to ask. Ashton J wants to know. How do you think that launching astronauts on American soil for the first time since 2011 will revolutionize future missions? 
Yeah, so what we're doing here is unlike we've, anything we've ever done before. We, we are not purchasing, owning, and operating the hardware. We are turning to commercial industry. We're, and, and going back to the spacesuits, it's the same for the capsule, it's the same for the rocket. We did not tell industry what to build. We gave them top level requirements. We said, here's the requirement for payload. Here's the requirement for safety. And then we let the innovators, commercial industry, American commercial industry, innovate. And they came up with solutions that had never been dreamed of before. Um, and that's the success of this program. Um, so we're really revolutionizing how we do space flight. Um, and, and I really think when we look into the future, we're going to see these models of doing business with public-private partnerships apply not just to low Earth orbit, which is what we're doing today, but we're taking this model to the moon and even on to Mars. And I hear something about Tom Cruise shooting a movie up at the International Space Station, is that right? I'll tell you what I told Elon <laughs> just yesterday, and that is this. Um, if people ask me about Tom Cruise all the time now, and the answer is yes. We would love Tom Cruise to fly to the International Space Station to make a movie. I'm all for that, and we're going to do what we can to make that happen. Um, but you should know this. There was a day when I was in elementary school, and I saw the movie Top Gun. And from that day, I knew that I was going to be a Navy pilot. It's just the way it was. Um, the goal here, and this is what we're doing today, exactly. and, and, and Elon is all about this. Get, 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 get the kids fired up about okay, wanting to wear that, that space suit, That's exactly wanting to fly right. that, you know, get, go to orbit, go to the moon, go to Mars, reigniting the, like I said, reigniting the dream of space, and just get, getting, you know, people of all walks of life, young, old, excited about the future, excited. I think anyone who, who has within them the spirit of exploration should love what's going on today. And if we can Absolutely. get Tom Cruise to inspire an elementary kid to join the Navy and be a pilot. Why can't we get Tom Cruise to inspire the next Elon Musk? That's what we need. We need a new generation of many Elon Musks, and that's what this launch is about today. I want to say, speaking of this inspiration piece, it's not by chance that we have the Secretary of Education of the United States of America here. This is all about the next generation. Um, if, if we have great success in our generation, it's not enough. It has to continue. The challenge with the Apollo program is that it ended. What we're doing now is sustainable, and that's why we have the public-private partnerships and commercial, um, commercial capabilities that are coming online. Very good. And the good news for Tom Cruise is he does a lot of his own stunts. Yeah. So in, not, so in zero gravity, he should get hurt a lot no, less, No, I, th right? I think it's right? going to be super cool. Yeah. You know, and, yeah, it's, yeah. It, and as, as Joe said, it's like this is going to, you know, you want to capture the public imagination, um, have them see cool, cool things happening in real orbit, you know, real space stations. Uh, it's like I think I'd want to watch that movie, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And and it's, it's like it, it like says I think it was like this is like just this is really just the beginning because we want to go from from low Earth orbit we want to go back to the moon not and the moon to stay have a moon base like moon base alpha, um, and, and and have a you know build a city on Mars and be a space faring civilization out there among the stars. This is a super exciting future that I think it, that's the kind of thing where you you like yeah let, let, can't wait for it to happen you know. If you can't get excited after listening to you guys, I'd say you need to have your pulse checked. Yeah. <laughs> Elon Musk, SpaceX CEO and Chief Engineer, thank you very much. Thank you. Jim Bridenstein, we appreciate you leading NASA in this time, Administrator for the agency. And we're going to send it back to Marie. All right, thanks a lot, Daryl. We saw in the meantime, uh, while that interview was going on, the hatch actually closed. So that happened a few minutes earlier than we expected, too. Um, our timeline has that happening at T-minus an hour and 55 minutes. So a few minutes ahead of schedule uh, right now with hatch close. And you can see the pad teams there just working on things now. Yeah, right now it looks like what they're doing is... Oh, what are they doing? So they perform a leak check. There is a mechanism there called a side hatch mechanism. That is what actually closes the hatch and seals it. And what we'll do is perform a leak check on that for a few minutes to make sure that that's nice and tight, that those O-rings are sealed really, really well. And uh, after that, we will install the, uh, yeah, you can see the leak check uh, ground support equipment there in the technician's hands there. And while we're watching this, Leland, I, I mean, we just heard uh, we just heard them talk a lot about inspiring the next generation. And you're a man of many talents. I, I know after um, your flights yourself, you used to have the head of NASA education. I mean, what did that stir up in you? You know, Marie, this what, what Elon said about reigniting the dream of space is so important that we get our young kids thinking about themselves being in these seats. And I I. When I first became an astronaut in 1998, I was riding on the back of a fire truck celebrating John Glenn's return to flight on a space shuttle. And 
I saw these two little kids. They had on orange pumpkin suits. And when their dad turned them around to point to look at me on the fire truck. And it was almost as though when they saw my face, they started launching into space with rocket fuel because they were inspired, because they saw someone who looked like them. And I think that if we can reignite this dream through SpaceX's launch, through the partnership with NASA, we can get so many more kids to believe in themselves and know that they can be just like Doug and Bob flying on the SpaceX Dragon. Absolutely. I mean, it's uh, it's really just breathtaking to see them there in their suits now and uh, looking at the screens in front of them. Lauren, I know we, we've talked a lot about the spacecraft. We've heard about that. But for, for folks that maybe are just tuning in, uh, what are they looking at in front of them now? Yeah, so they have three different touch screens in front of them. Uh, overall, that whole uh, assembly there is called the control panel. So you'll have those three LCD touch screens in front of them where uh, they have the displays are showing them um, details on the vehicle's pressure, its temperature, uh, there's audio control. Um, that center screen has the procedures that they're going through today on day of launch. Um, you can also see the the vehicle's attitude. You can see its velocity, its apogee, its perigee, its inclination, uh, details on the status of the hatch, the thermal control system loops, basically all the cool stuff that helps them have situational awareness of the vehicle. Um, that's displayed on those displays. Um, additionally, there are some actual buttons on that button panel that you see down below. And uh, that some of the things that that allow them to do is if the crew ever needed to do any sort of manual overrides like that right in the middle right underneath that center lcd screen that's the crew's ability to initiate an abort it's called an abort handle and it's right in the middle where both crew members could use it if they needed to and the audio controls um, are also on those button panels when they're not in their suits uh, there's actually speakers that are coming off of the control panel that allow them to hear mission control, hear the core, hear ISS um, when they're not in their suits where the audio systems are integrated into that. And we see, we see them using the touch screens now. Leland, what's your take on this? Because this has got to look totally different from what you were looking at during shuttle. Touch screens. <laughs> we had these... <laughs> these displays and these buttons and you know we we it was it was one of those moments when I'm looking at this now when I had knee boards that had procedures and things on there and the procedures are now all run in that middle screen and the malfunctions and the things that you do to mitigate problems with the uh, with the vehicle if something happens it's all controlled right there with the two of them and so it's a it's a radical departure from what we did with the shuttle but it's again ushering in this new era of space travel post ingress brief and a check on how that suit air feels about now. And we're going to listen now for an announcement right, we're ready. about hatch closer. Copy. Well, today we are not tracking any issues on Dragon and F9 currently. Um, for a weather update, the weather line that is overhead, which is what you saw when you were ingressing, is now moving offshore. The next radar return is a cell over Orlando, which is expected to be our decision gate for today, and that is currently eroding. That's uh, good news, thank you. Copy, and then one additional item, uh, the Cabo, the orbit site, uh, remains as briefed, so no change there, but I do want to make you aware that that is slightly west of Cabo for go weather, um, so you just want to target the longitude if needed. Okay, Dragon copy, slightly west. Uh, we'll target the longitude, and uh, the uh, suit air has cooled off, so we appreciate that as well. Copy, outstanding. Uh, let us know if you have any questions, and we'll keep you posted as the closeout team completes the leak check. Dragon copy. So what we actually heard was a little bit more discussion about the weather, uh, still looking at things, and if we're about a minute away from an announcement about hatch closed, closure. Excuse me.
you're just joining us, we're at T minus one hour, 55 minutes and counting, and we're expecting an announcement to confirm hatch closure in just a few seconds. Dragon SpaceX uh, for comp checks with Falcon 9. Go ahead. Okay, uh, we are ready for that at that time. Uh, if you are ready. We are ready. All stations up on countdown net for section 54.49, F9 responsible engineer communication check with the crew. Start with uh, guidance, navigation, and control. Dragon GNC on countdown one, comm check. GNC, Dragon, loud and clear. GNC, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by the propulsion engineer. Dragon, prop on countdown one, comm check. Prop, Dragon, loud and clear. Prop, loud and clear, stand by for comm check with the avionics engineer. Dragon, avionics on countdown one, comm check. Avionics, Dragon, we have good loud and clear. Avionics, loud and clear, stand by for comm check with the ground segment engineer. Dragon, ground segment on countdown one, comm check. Ground segment, Dragon, loud and clear. Ground segment loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by launch control. Dragon, launch control and countdown one, comm check. Launch control, Dragon, loud and clear. Launch control loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by the chief engineer. Dragon, chief engineer on countdown one, comm check. Bala, Dragon has you loud and clear. Chief Engineer, loud and clear. This completes the F-9 Responsible Engineer comm checks. Dragon, Chief Engineer on Dragon to ground. Go ahead, sir. I was just uh, doing a comm check on this loop. Uh, good luck, guys, and buckle in. Thanks to you and the F-9 team, Bala. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Bala. So we just heard a series of comm checks there, and Lauren, um, I don't know if you want to describe a little bit more about why that's important, and, and we heard the acronym GNC. Um, they said guidance, navigation, and control really quickly, and then went back to the acronym GNC. Can you kind of explain to folks what that means? Yeah, uh, the launch chief engineer, Bala, as you heard them thanking him towards the end, initiated a comm check with all of the different subsystems that uh, those those engineers that are on console and those operators today and talking with the crew, making sure that um, they were able to communicate with them bidirectionally and just handing that check off from all of the different stations on console today. That was really, really cool. We obviously don't do that when there's a, a satellite on top of the rocket. So this is the first time for a real flight that we've done that operation. It's very awesome. And now that the hatch is closed, um, a lot of the a lot of the work of this team is is done, but I mean they're they're obviously not finished. They're not ready to leave the white room just yet. You were you were talking to some folks about what's going on in this room now. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, they should be completing the hatch leak check. Uh, that's you sort of pressurize that area between. Uh, there's two O-rings that are there, and uh, we want to pressurize that area, see if it holds pressure. It's a very very uh, sensitive test very high um, criteria for passing. And so once that leak check is shown to be okay, and that the capsule or that those O-rings are able to hold pressure, uh, what the team will do is they'll go back uh, into that area, into that access panel and install what we call the SPEP, which, this, which is the side pressure equalization plug. 
um, once that is plugged, you've really closed everything up. And when the crew splashes down, what they'll actually do is pull that plug to equalize pressure across the hatch so that you don't cause the hatch to buckle due to a pressure, or sorry, the hatch or the, the capsule, the weldment, any of the vehicle to buckle due to a pressure different, differential. So they should be adding that plug, and then they'll cover up that side hatch access panel with the TPS panel or thermal protection system panel, close it up, and that'll make sure it stays safe on ascent. And now, obviously, we're looking at a view from the outside of the top of Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. We can confirm a good side hatch leak check. Right. Dragon copies, good leak check. And we just heard confirmation of a good leak check. If you're just joining us, you're looking at the Falcon 9 rocket with Crew Dragon sitting on top. Inside that capsule on top are NASA astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley. And we are inside of two hours until liftoff, if the weather holds up. There's another stunning aerial view of the crew access arm extended out towards Crew Dragon. That is the final path that the astronauts took to climb aboard Dragon before they strapped into their seats and the hatch closed. And no doubt Bob and Doug are focused on the mission ahead, but you know, we, we also heard um, the administrator and Elon Musk talking about how they've been kind of jovial and joking around. And, and Leland, you, you kind of mentioned to me uh, during that segment that that's really important. It really is, Marie. When we were in the vehicle uh, after we got to this point when the hatch was closed, we were all <laughs> going back to those moments of our training, you know, when we were going through, you know, asset and entry training on the shuttle and just different phases of flight that we would be going through. And we would think about some of our instructors who got us there. You know, in our crew notebooks, we would have names of people that were very impactful in making sure that we were perfect in our in our training. And um, and that looks like a view of Air Force One flying near Launch Pad 39A for a special guest to have a special view of the astronauts on the launch pad. President Trump uh, on board making his way to Kennedy Space Center to hopefully view a launch at 4.33 this afternoon. And there they are in view of the launch pad. So no doubt he's looking at the window looking out the window at Bob and Doug on the pad. That's uh, got to be an amazing sight to see from on board Air Force One. And we are at T minus one hour, 46 minutes, 22 seconds and counting from launch. And guys, the last time we, we actually did a little bit of research when we found out uh, that the president was coming, the last president to witness a launch from here at Kennedy Space Center was Bill Clinton. That was back in October 1998 for STS-95. So it's been a minute. Okay, um, and we are about 56 seconds away from the, oh, no, we're not. We have an hour and 56 seconds away. Never mind. Instead, we are uh, one hour and 45 minutes away from launch. And Tahira, you are there with the social teams. I bet you are seeing some excitement on all the things we just saw on the screen there. 
Hey, Lauren. I mean, like you said, things are really ramping up on social media right now, especially seeing that hatch close and also just watching this flyover happen. We are up to 1.7 million viewers across all of our social media channels. And let's check out what people are saying on Twitter right now. So it looks like we've got more creativity still going on. Some people are crying with pride in Houston. Feel it. We even have Elizabeth Banks, who from the Hunger Games. That's awesome. We have more just good luck and well wishes for Bob and Doug across the nation. This has been a constant online today, which is so great to see. More just future astronauts and kiddos getting excited. We even have the band Bastille tuning in for launch. This is awesome. And just looks like more people standing by to witness this historic launch today. And so, guys, on top of what's being said on social media, we've also got a lot of well wishes from everyone across our country showing us what today means in their creative way. So let's take a look at that video. I am so ready to launch America. Wow, I mean, guys, just look at everybody excited for today's launch. If that doesn't get you pumped, like, come on, let's go. We even got to see astronaut Snoopy in there, which is a personal favorite of mine. I actually have my lucky Snoopy pin here. You probably can't see it, but he is literally my spirit animal. Anyways, guys, get excited. The time is almost here. And with that, let's toss back to Lauren at Kennedy. Lauren. Thanks, Tahira. Tahira likes the Snoopy. I like the little girl doing the worm, Leland. She wasn't doing the meatball. She was doing the worm. There's someone out there doing the meatball, I'm sure. <laughs> I want to know what that looks like. No, I, I don't. I'm not, I don't. <laughs> Clearly, this is capturing, capturing the attention of people all across the country and the world. So please continue to join the conversation by using the hashtag Launch America across Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And we've had the opportunity to share with you a lot about the SpaceX Crew Dragon vehicle the crew is sitting in right now, a lot about the crew themselves and the significance of today as the official return of human launch capability to American shores. And now we want to turn our attention to where the crew is going, the International Space Station. And for that, let's take you to Mission Control in Houston. Gary? Thank you, Marie. The International Space Station is an incredible facility whose construction, operation, and ongoing science, all these efforts have been made possible by an unprecedented international collaboration. So to tell us more about the space station, we have International Space Station Chief Scientist Kurt Costello with us. Kurt, welcome. Gary, thank you. It's an amazing day to be here to talk to you about this historic launch to the ISS. It really is. Now, many viewers may not realize that there is a laboratory that's the size of a football field 250 miles above the Earth, and that it's been there for nearly 20 years conducting revolutionary science. Can you share with us more about what the space station is and what it's accomplished so far? Sure, Gary. Over those 20 years, we've conducted over 3,100 experiments on board the space station. Those 3,100 experiments have been done by over 4,100 investigators and represent the work of over 108 regions and countries. The work going on on the space station is not only there to help us with our exploration goals for how to go further into space, but also to bring back benefits for Earth and to produce a commercial marketplace in low Earth orbit. All three of these um, objectives, along with the international cooperation that it took to build such an amazing laboratory in space, are great examples of the objectives of the ISS program. 
Kurt, we know that today's mission is critical to providing us with a steady cadence of operational flights. But why is it so important for us to have this capability from a research perspective? That's a great question. Today's test flight brings us to the beginning of the commercial crew program, a commercial crew program which will raise our occupancy on the U.S. segment of the space station to four astronauts. And that fourth astronaut comes as a real premium to doing research on the space station. The tasks don't get particularly um, more intensive to do systems and maintenance, so that fourth astronaut that time becomes dedicated to performing more science. In fact, enough time that it will essentially double the amount of crew time we have to perform experiments on board station. The return to U.S. soil also brings us the ability to return samples more quickly and get human samples back down to the ground more quickly as well. Kurt, you're talking about all this great research, you're talking about uh, scientific experiments, but what would you say to someone who's watching this and thinking, this isn't relevant to me, I'm never going to space, I don't do science, what do you say to those people? Well, again, one of the focuses is on the ISS benefits for humanity. And for all of us who've been stuck at home during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we've been wondering, wouldn't it be nice to have more bandwidth? Why does the internet slow down? Some of the research we're doing on board space station, particularly into Zeblan optical fiber, is using the fact that we don't have sedimentation in a microgravity environment to develop new materials that will help us build more uh, perfect fiber optic cables, which will allow us for better bandwidth and lower cost in implementing uh, networks here on Earth. And then if you're not really a tech geek, <clears throat> maybe your interests lie more in human health. And then we have multiple experiments going on to help us develop new drugs, new treatments on board the ISS. Pharmaceutical companies are uh, working on methods that allow us to crystallize uh, proteins in space in a more purified and more standardized method. And this could lead to monoclonal antibody suspensions that we can treat through injection instead of a painful infusion. We also are developing uh, studies into uh, our capability to produce tissues and uh, organs in space. Again, because you don't have sedimentation, there's a capability there to produce more uh, realistic tissues uh, that can someday possibly be used to prevent human disease. Now, Kurt, I know they have some cargo going up with them, but I understand they plan to bring some science back. That's right, Gary. A lot of their cargo going up with them are crew supplies and EVA supplies to support them if they have to do EVAs on board. But the cargo they'll be bringing down is science, and it comes from across the spectrum. We have uh, student experiments in seeds that will be returning with the, uh, the Crew Dragon. Uh, we'll, we also have a number of experiments that are dependent on their samples returning in frozen lockers on board the SpaceX Dragon uh, to be able to do the science there. Those include rodent research tissues from the National Lab Rodent Research 17 mission and also our veggie experiments, which are experiments in growing plants in space that will be needed when we go to more distant uh, locations like the moon and Mars. International Space Station Chief Scientist Kurt Costello, thank you so much for your time. Let's hear now from one of the next astronauts to fly to station on a Crew Dragon talking with Marina Jerica. Marina. Thank you so much. I am so honored to be a part of today's momentous launch. My guest is no stranger to the International Space Station and will return there for the first time in nearly a decade for his third space flight with the Crew-1 launch expected later this year. Having logged 177 days in space from flights on the Space Shuttle Discovery to the Soyuz, JAXA astronaut Soichi Noguchi will have spent more time in space than any of his other crewmates. It is my pleasure to Welcome him here with us today. Thank you so much for joining us, Soichi. Honjitsu wa arigato gozaimasu. Wow, that's wonderful. Marina, how are you doing? Thanks for having me today. This is uh, wonderful. Today we are celebrating the launch, so uh, I'm happy to be here. 
Thank you so much for being here with us. I am sure you have felt the excitement for today's launch, Soichi, and you will be on the next Crew Dragon flight after this one. Are you excited to launch from Kennedy Space Center again, and how are you preparing for this new vehicle? Yes, definitely we are excited to go back to Kennedy Space Center. My first space flight was from Kennedy Space Center on the Space Shuttle Discovery. That was 15 years ago, but my memory is still fresh. I still feel the vibration of the launch, the same launch pad of 39A that the demo to go up, and the same launch pad that we will go up uh, as a crew one. And uh, our crew is getting ready for the final uh, training phase, which will come uh, in the coming weeks. And uh, the mood is really high, and we are ready to go up. And as you know, the International Space Station and space exploration is an international effort. How do you feel representing the Japanese Space Agency once again on the ISS? Well, I think the, the strengths of the International Space Station is the diversity of the, all the participating countries. And adding the diversity is definitely gives a rigidity to the program. And the same applies to our crew, our crew one. Our crew one, uh, we are four of us, but uh, quite a different background, uh, quite a different uh, ethnicity, and uh, definitely the diversity is the key word of our success to the crew one. And I'm sure it will be very successful. What are you looking forward to once you get back to the ISS? Well, this will be my third uh, visit to the International Space Station. I'd like to see the things uh, my colleagues uh, keep saying, hey, you got to visit the space, space station again because it's getting more comfortable, more roomy, and uh, I cannot wait to go back to my sleep station after 10 years. And nothing beats that view, does it? Oh, definitely. Uh, my last flight, we actually installed a big window called the cupola, and uh, that was a big hit, obviously. This is uh, the number one uh, leisure time for astronauts, and um, I'm ready to shoot as many photos as I can this time as well. Amazing. I will look forward to seeing those photos. I'm sure you remember exactly what it feels like in these moments right before a launch. What do you think Robert Benkin and Douglas Hurley are feeling right now as they prepare to head to the ISS? Well, uh, Doug and Bob's uh, space shuttle uh, veterans, they know the drill. They have, they have launched, uh, they, they experienced the launch before. So I think they're pretty relaxed. And uh, so far through my training, I learned that most of the, uh, the steps before the launch is quite similar to what we have in the space shuttle days. So, uh, you know, different suit, different vehicle, but uh, all the necessity steps uh, to, to go up into the capsule should feel similar. So I'm pretty sure they are relaxed. Of course, they are very excited. I'm sure they are. Gokatsu yakuo, oinori shiteimasu. Honjitsu wa arigato gozaimashita. Thank you so much, Soichi, for joining us today. Oh, Marina, you are so good. Domo arigato. And uh, we all both enjoyed the beautiful lunch today. Thank you very much for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good luck with your launch later this year. And as the excitement builds towards launch, I will send it back to you. Thank you, Marina. I now have the distinct pleasure of being joined by one of NASA's record-setting astronauts and a recent resident aboard the International Space Station, Christina Cook. Christina, thanks for joining us. Great to be with you, Dan. Christina, we're coming up on 20 years of continuous human presence on the space station, and you were one of those humans. What's it like to see a new milestone like this launch unfold after so much history already? So much history indeed. Um, it is really just such a testament to NASA. Not only are we pushing the boundaries of knowledge and discovery and exploration, but we're pushing the boundaries on how we accomplish that mission. We're bringing in commercial partners. We're fostering a space economy. So we're making sure that we're always pushing forward, always taking that next step. I think it's such a privilege to be part of an organization that recognizes if we're not actually making steps and in innovating every single time we do this, then we're not truly answering humanity's call to explore and to push those boundaries. Christina, I know Bob and Doug are veterans themselves, but what advice do you have for Bob and Doug, given your experience as a long-duration station crew member? Well, being able to live
live on board the International Space Station and work there is just such a privilege. You know, you're a steward of this amazing laboratory that's bringing so many benefits down to Earth and also learning how we can push farther into the universe. So it is quite an honor, and I think that's the main thing about how it feels to be up there for a long duration. You know, in terms of advice, um, Bob and Doug have been great mentors for me. They've given me advice for so many years. It's strange to be the one who could be in a position to offer them anything. But I would say that as, you know, shuttle flyers, they used to participate in missions that were really, really intense, go, go, go all the time. Long duration space flight is more of a marathon than a sprint. So I would tell them to take that moment, enjoy it, and, you know, really welcome the opportunity to have part of your mission be taking it all in and sharing that with the people that got you there. Thanks again, Christina. Always a pleasure to hear from you and fantastic words. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. My pleasure. So once again, Bob and Doug, once Bob and Doug arrive at the station, um, they'll be greeted by astronaut Chris, Chris Cassidy. But before we do that, let's toss to a briefing. Hello everyone, I'm astronaut Chris Cassidy, commander of Expedition 63 on board the International Space Station, flying 250 miles above the Earth. Like you, I'm excited about today's launch and the possibilities it will bring to America and to the world. But also, I'm very excited that two close friends will be arriving and joining the crew. I had the privilege of flying with Doug Hurley on both of our first shuttle missions back in 2009. Together, we came to the International Space Station and helped construct the amazing facility that it is today. Although this will be my first mission with Bob, it was my honor to follow him as the chief of the office when he left back in 2015 to begin training for this amazing mission. Personally, I've been very fortunate to fly in two different spacecraft. Launching from America on the shuttle, and most recently launching from Kazakhstan in the Soyuz. But I can't tell you how exciting it is to know that we're once again launching Americans from the coast of Florida. And finally, here's a story I'd like to share with you. Back in 1981, John Young and Bob Crippen launched on Space Shuttle Columbia, the very first space shuttle flight, marking the last time we flew Americans on a brand new vehicle. With them, they flew an American flag representing America's technical prowess. Roger Thirty years later, that same flag was flown to the International Space Station. This flag remains here today, waiting for Bob and Doug. Our flag means so many things to our country, and this small piece of America represents what we'll be able to achieve together. We'll never stop exploring. And so Bob and Doug can take this very special flag home to Earth, where it awaits its next journey to the cosmos. In a few years, the first Orion crew will take this flag with it around the moon. All of this starts today. I'll be watching outside the window, along with everyone else in America and around the world. I can't wait to look out the window and see my friends on close approach. Go Falcon 9, go Dragon, and go Bob and Doug. I'll see you soon. 
And that was a very special message from NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy. Right now, the lone American aboard the International Space Station, so he will be ready and waiting to welcome Bob and Doug uh, when they arrive tomorrow, if liftoff happens today, a uh, little uh, later tomorrow morning. The countdown now stands at T minus one hour, 25 minutes, 54 seconds, and counting until launch. And we'd like to share with you just how much has happened here at Kennedy Space Center since the last time we had a crew on the pad launching from here. As you can imagine, the end of the shuttle era was a bittersweet moment for many people across this spaceport. But in the end, we knew we were striving for this day, and here we are. Joining us now is Kennedy Space Center's Deputy Director, Janet Petro, on the comeback we've seen across Florida's Space Coast. She's with Daryl Nail now at OSB2. Daryl? Yeah, thank you, Marie. Janet, uh, you were just telling me you were there at the crew walkout. Um, tell me a little bit about what you saw between the astronauts and their families. So it was uh, very historic. It was very uh, emotional. So when Doug and Bob first came out of the uh, doors, you know, of course, a cheer went up from everybody. You know, the vice president was there, Elon was there, uh, the crew families was there, and of course, uh, uh, Bob, myself, and the rest of uh, the center leadership was there to cheer them on. Um, but then, the, you know, when they came out and uh, then they went to the families and uh, Bob Benkin said virtual hug and he, he shouted out a virtual hug and he did this motion and of course his uh, his child also did that uh, virtual hug and so I guess that's the uh, tradition of doing a virtual hug with mm -hmm. the uh, families and then they um, uh, you know then they walked and got in the Tesla um, either side and the family walked right up to the uh, window of the Tesla and were talking you know having a private last moment with their um, with their father, uh, hand on the window. It was very emotional. I had tears in my eyes. I don't know how many other people had tears in their eyes, but it was it was really a special emotional moment, and everybody was, of course, wishing them well. Um, a lot of a lot, I love yous, a lot of uh, Godspeeds, a lot of Ad Astra, you know, take mm -hmm. care, all of that. So it was very special. That, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, and in the context of why it's so important, Janet, you remember, you've been here since 2007. Yeah, yeah. You were here in 2011 when Shuttle Atlantis came to wheel stop. I've, I've talked to my uncle and father who worked out here. You know, layoff notices went out like the next day when the shuttle came to a stop. Um, it was a very sad time. Bob Cabana, the director here, called, called it depressing. Uh, tell me about that time and how far we've come. Yeah, so uh, as you as you note, it was the end of a very iconic program. You know, a lot of people had spent their entire career uh, working on the space shuttle program. So 135 flights, um, all of them launching from Launch Complex 39, many from 39A, where we're going to be launching from today, and then returning back, you know, at the shuttle landing facility, those two iconic sonic booms was something that all along the Space Coast people really uh, resonated with, really felt in their hearts and looked forward to. So. It was a, it was a very sad time, but I will tell you that 30-year program we had planned for it. Um, the the workforce was incredible. You know, there was there was a lot of people who, as I said, spent their entire career here, and they wanted to safely fly that shuttle out, and then they retired. There was also another large uh, group of people that just wanted to put on their resume that they had been privileged to work on the space shuttle. So the the workforce I was uh, incredibly proud of because they were um, resilient. They were dedicated, they were committed to safely flying out that shuttle. They didn't skip any steps. And regardless, as you said, that they knew they were getting their layoff notices. Uh, I think it landed on a Wednesday. They were getting their layoff notice on a Friday. They were in it till the end to make sure we safely flew it out. And of course, you know, we had 14,000 uh, workers out here then, mm -hmm. um, uh, which we have uh, a lot fewer here today. Um, and of course, our guest operations, you remember those last shuttle flights, everybody around the country wanted to be a part of that experience. And we at the center really leaned forward to maximize how many people we could get both on site uh, and never mind how many people were lined up at the beaches all along the river to watch that uh, last flight. And of course, today with COVID, unfortunately, we weren't able to have any um, on-site guest operations, which was pretty sad for this historic flight. But I'll bet that there's a ton of people watching uh, from the beaches or from even their TV as we uh, launch here today. I'm sure there is. And uh, tribute to your leadership and Bob Cabanas as well. Uh, getting things turned around here as a multi-user spaceport, getting the commercial entities in here. We appreciate all that you've done to make that happen. Janet Petro, pre appreciate you being here. Thank you, Daryl. All right, Marie, we'll toss it back to you.
All right, thanks, Daryl. And as NASA and SpaceX have worked for years to get to this moment, today's mission opens the door to an entirely new era in human spaceflight, not only for astronauts, but someday for the general public as well. From the beginning, it has been our mission at SpaceX to help make humanitary, wow, humanity, a multiplanetary species. And today's mission is an important step towards that goal. The key to opening up space access for people like you and me is reusability. Without it, traveling to space is just far too expensive for the average person to do. Imagine how expensive a flight from L.A. to New York would be if you had to throw the plane away after a single trip. A that, lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That ticket would cost hundreds of millions of dollars, and almost no one could ever afford to fly. Both the Dragon spacecraft and the Falcon 9 rocket are designed to be reusable, which not only improves the reliability of the vehicles in that they're flight-proven again and again, but it also drives down cost. This is essential to enabling not just a handful of people, but rather hundreds of thousands of people to get out there and to explore the moon, Mars, beyond. And I, for one, it is my dream to visit Jupiter's ocean moon, Europa. Leland, you're one of the lucky Earthlings that's had the opportunity to get off the planet and go explore. Where would you like to go next? You know, Lauren, I think I would like to go to Mars and, you know, be there for, you know, a, a year, about a year each way and then a year on the Martian surface. But the one condition I would have to have, my pups would have to go with me <laughs> because it's about exploring new places, but taking your family with you. You know, we have these crewmates that are people that you get to know and love, you know, over a course of training. But it's nothing like having your family with you. And I think that's something that we're going to be seeing in the future, people living and working on other planets as a family. I think Absolutely. there are a lot of people who want to see your dogs with you in space. <laughs> <laughs> well, we saw, we've saw we seen them in, a, in an official portrait. I know that the dogs came in with you to take a picture in your spacesuit and back in the day. Yeah, we there kinda, it is. Well, we kind of oh, snuck yeah. them in, uh, you know, no, no dogs allowed at NASA. <laughs> <laughs> well, they had their moment. They sure did. And uh, knowing that the opportunity to fly to space as a private citizen or a private dog maybe one day is right around the corner, uh, we have a new poll question on Twitter for you. So if you were given the opportunity, would you travel to space? Let us know, and we'll share the results a little bit later. All stations come All right. Up. Well, there is not a lot of cargo. Deep engineer and technical poll for oh. launch escape arming and propellant lift. All right, now while there's not a lot of cargo in today's mission, Dragon is carrying two special payloads, aside from Bob and Doug, of course. The first is a series of custom art pieces entitled Humankind by Los Angeles artist Tristan Eaton. These indestructible double-sided paintings are made from gold, brass, and aluminum, and they celebrate how far humanity has come as well as how far we still have to go. It includes a beautiful homage to the Saturn V rocket, as well as a nod to Bob and Doug's current ride to space. You can find more images and information about these pieces on SpaceX's social channels. Next, in the spirit of inspiring the next generation of explorers, we wanted to celebrate the class of 2020, from kindergarten all the way through graduate school. SpaceX and NASA invited students from around the world to submit their photo to fly on America's first human spaceflight in nearly a decade. Each graduate's photo was used to create a mosaic image of the planet Earth, which we printed, and is being flown aboard Bob and Doug's flight on the Crew Dragon spacecraft. We received nearly 100,000 photos. So thank you and congratulations to all the world's graduates. I am so proud of what we're doing today. And I think about regular people flying in space on a SpaceX rocket one day. When I first went to space, I thought my primary task of installing the Columbus Laboratory would be my aha moment. But it was when Peggy Whitson invited us over to the Russian segment to have a meal. She said, you guys bring the rehydrated vegetables, we'll have the meat. And <laughs> we're, we're, you know, we're doing this, having this meal, and it's with African-American, Asian-American, French, German, Russian, the first female commander breaking bread at 17,500 miles an hour going around the planet every 90 minutes. 
And when I think of that perspective shift that I got looking out the window, flying over my hometown, flying over Leo's hometown in Paris, flying over uh, Yuri's hometown in Russia, it brought us all together as a civilization. And I think that's what spaceflight does for us. The more people that have the opportunity to go to space will feel like it's, a, it's an international family of people working together for the good of humanity and all humankind. Absolutely, and it, it's exactly what that piece of art was all about. Yeah, and following today's mission, we will be one step closer to a future where we can all have that experience. We can all have that orbital perspective and the ability to explore new worlds. In just over an hour from now, Bob and Doug will be the first people to launch on an American vehicle in almost a decade. For the team at SpaceX, it's really hard to put into words how honored we feel about the trust that Bob, Doug, and NASA have put into our team to carry out this critical mission. I worked on Crew Dragon for, for two years, and I can just imagine what all of my friends and colleagues are thinking right now as they sit in anticipation and excitement for what's to come. Absolutely. And speaking of those who have carried the hopes and dreams of science and exploration, we have a few shout outs to share with you from some big fans of NASA and SpaceX. Wow, we're making history again. The NASA program. I am there with you guys in spirit. Bob, Doug, good luck. I know you'll be fine. I'll be watching and got everything crossed, arms, legs. I'm tied in a knot. Can't wait for you to get back safely. This is the first time a U.S. built rocket has taken people into space in nine years. It's quite an accomplishment. So for us at the Planetary Society, more rockets means more exploration. More people in space means more exploration. More countries involved in the endeavor of spaceflight means more exploration. This is how we know the cosmos and our place within it. So congratulations, SpaceX. Here's wishing your team and the crew especially a safe journey and the joy of discovery. Let's go. And a big thanks to William Shatner and Bill Nye for those well wishes. And while we're keeping an eye on the pad, we want to bring in NASA astronaut Rex Walheim. If that name rings a bell, it's because he flew three space shuttle missions to the International Space Station, including the final one by Atlantis, STS-135. He was one of the last four people to ascend the tower at Pad 39A and head to space. And he currently is Deputy Director of Safety and Mission Assurance at Johnson Space Center in Houston. Rex Walheim, thanks for joining us. Uh, you and Leland actually flew together. Hey, Rex we dog. Really enjoyed flying with Leland. Oh. Hey, old dog. <laughs> Rex, you flew on the final shuttle mission, we said STS-135, with Doug, in fact. What's it like seeing him in Crew Dragon right now? It's great. This is what we've been looking forward to. You know, after the uh, end of the shuttle program, you know, it was a very important time we wanted to transition to this commercialization of space flight to allow these commercial companies to uh, take our astronauts to and from the space station. So in the nine years we've had since uh, we last landed on Atlantis, we've really worked hard for that. We've worked with our SpaceX partners and our Boeing partners, and here we are. Today's the day. We're taking that first step uh, in this new era. What do you remember most about launch day for STS-135? I think it was just you, you felt the, the weight of it. Uh, the this, this space shuttle was a story program, 135 flights and thousands of people had poured their lives into this program to launch probes to the planets, to launch the Hubble Space Telescope, and then, of course, to build the International Space Station. So you knew the incredible accomplishments of this program, and so you wanted to finish strong. And then when it finally became uh, launch day, you'd finished the study, you'd worked really hard, and now it was time to kind of soak it in. And I think that's what Bob and Doug are doing right now. They're sitting on the vehicle, talking to each other, listening to the sounds, and uh, feeling the vibrations as it starts up. And uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a great uh, great experience for them. Hi, Rex. What is your take on private astronauts going to space? I think it's great. I think the the more we can do to commercialize space to to make access easier, the better we are. And I think uh, that's uh, part of this whole program. You get the cost down, then more people can afford it. And you get the cost down, you can do more things in space, more science, more research. And uh, 
uh, it is a transformative experience to fly in space, and I wish more people could see that. Uh, when you look out on the planet, like Liam was talking about earlier, with your crewmates from different countries all around the world, it gives you different perspective. It gives you a perspective that we're all crewmates on this planet Earth, and we kind of get that now with the pandemic. We understand that we're all in this together, and uh, that's what the space program does, and I want to see more people get a chance to uh, see the Earth from that vantage point, and I think it'll bring us all closer together. Hey, Rex, a very serious question here. The worm or the meatball? The worm or the meatball? <laughs> Leland, I saw you dissing the, the worm earlier. How can you do that? The worm is awesome. I'm so glad to have the NASA worm insignia back. It's great. All right. Well, thank you very much, Rex. We appreciate you. And as we watch um, the... As we watch uh, Bob and Doug there in the capsule, uh, we are an hour, 10 minutes, 57 seconds and counting from launch, and we're going to send it over to Hawthorne for an update. Jesse? Thanks, Marie. We're just an hour and 13 minutes away from launch, launch and, and things are really getting ready to pick up here. Since arriving at the spacecraft, Bob and Doug were helped by our closeout engineers to get into their seats, attach their suits to special umbilicals that provide breathing air, pressurized nitrox, and a commu communication link to Dragon systems. They conducted leak checks, which were successful, and communications checks with the core here in Hawthorne, which is the person who will speak to them directly throughout the, the entire mission, as well as the launch director in Florida. This is where they are checking their compass through both ground stations and tra the tracking and data relay satellites that we'll use to talk to the crew the entire way to the station. That's right, and after those suit checks were complete, the closeout team was able to seal up the hatch, which also got its own leak check, and we confirmed that it was good to go. The closeout team at this point has already departed the area yeah, around the pad. They're about 25 minutes ahead of their schedule, and right now weather operators are kicking off their final check on wind speeds at the pad, which are going to be used, and they're really important for that final go-no-go -go for launch. Before we get to that final go, no go, various teams at both NASA and SpaceX are going to do some internal go polls, just making sure conditions are good with Falcon 9, the Dragon, the crew, the range, and the space station before the final go is given. So let's check back in with Houston real quick for a status on the team there supporting the space station on their readiness for launch. In Mission Control Houston, led by Flight Director Zeb Scoville, has been pulled, and we're go for launch. All systems on board the station that are required to be healthy for the mission are reported good, and we're standing by. Station power and communication systems are looking healthy, life support systems and thermal conditions are normal, and the trajectory is right on track to ensure that Dragon's flight will meet right up with the orbiting complex as planned. Chris Cassidy aboard the International Space Station is finishing up some tasks, going into his pre-sleep period, and will be able to watch the launch of Bob and Doug. Mission Control Houston will largely be in the monitor mode for the first 18 hours of the flight, with the team here really jumping into the mix tomorrow when Dragon gets in range of the International Space Station, and we begin integrated operations. So I'll send it back. Everything's green on our board from the International Space Station. Go Falcon 9, go Dragon, and Godspeed to Bob and Doug. All right, thank you, Gary. If you are just now joining us, you picked a really good time because we are one hour, eight minutes and counting away from launch. And this is our coverage for this mission known as Demonstration Mission 2 or Demo 2. Liftoff time still holding for 4.33 p.m. Eastern, tracking no issues with Falcon 9 or Dragon, and we're still waiting for that weather to hopefully cooperate. We're still tracking a few things like precipitation and flight through clouds. We're hoping that clears within the next 20 minutes or so. Over the last three hours, our crew members, Doug Hurley and Bob Bankin, donned their SpaceX suits in the historic crew quarters suit-up room and made their way out to launch pad 39A. They walked out of the crew quarters building just as every astronaut to fly from this spaceport has done since Apollo 7. They were transported to the pad where the crew now on board the Crew Dragon spacecraft and we're continuing to get views of them inside that cabin live. Today is a historic launch. It will be the first time a commercially built spacecraft will launch people into orbit and the Stage first time since the U.S. has sent people to the space station from American soil since 2011 with the retirement of the space shuttle program. Over the next hour, we will conduct a series of polls to get ready for launch, have Bob and Doug arm the launch escape system and begin and fueling Falcon 9. Started. Launch is set for 4.33 p.m. Eastern. This will include a 12-minute flight to orbit and then a 19-hour flight to dock with the International Space Station at 11.30 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow.
Today's mission is the culmination of years of work between the teams at SpaceX and at NASA. Demo 2 is going to be an end-to-end -end flight test. We're going to start with launch today, go all the way to docking with the space station, and then when Bob and Doug come home, splashing down in the Atlantic. And this is going to be the final test for NASA to certify SpaceX for regular crew flights to the space station. And we've been hearing a little from the crew on board Dragon, which is which they are currently strapped into their seats, as you can see on your right screen. Uh, they're already through their seats, or they're, they've already been strapped into their seats and through communications and leak checks, they're able to follow all the milestones Dragon, still ahead on those displays, just above them, that you can see there. Go ahead. Yeah, we're going to equalize the pressures in the common manifolds just to raise them a little bit. So we will be momentarily cycling the tank isolation valves. I uh, just wanted to uh, let you know for awareness. Just wanted to take a pause to listen into the nets. Okay, we appreciate that, Jay. So they'll be getting insight into all of the Dragon and Falcon 9 systems as we proceed towards launch. At T minus one hour and seven minutes, let's check in with John Insprecher for a status update on both of those vehicles. What's the update, John? Well, the good news is we've had a smooth countdown this afternoon. SpaceX team is working no technical issues on either the Falcon 9 or the Dragon spacecraft. For the Falcon 9, operators have complete, or well, they are actually still in work. They're going to complete in a few minutes propulsion checkouts that are being done on both the first and second stages. The team will be assessing their launch readiness with a final go, no go pull. That'll come at T minus 45 minutes, and that'll be followed by propellant loading starting at T minus 35 minutes. Now, earlier today, Dragon operators performed a series of checkouts of Dragon's flight systems. The spacecraft is also currently go for launch. Our NASA crew, astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin, that you can see inside the Dragon capsule on the right hand side of the display, they are currently going through uh, the various screens, simple checks, their uh, hatch is closed, suit leak checks are complete, comp checks are good. The next major event for Dragon is going to be retract of the crew access arm that you can see on the left monitor up alongside the Dragon capsule. That's going to happen somewhere between 45 and 42 minutes before liftoff. Now the big one right now is the range. The range is currently red for launch from historic pad 39A. Now the air in the sea space is clear and the worldwide network of ground stations as well as the tracking and data relay satellites, they are ready to support Dragon as it heads into orbit. But the range is red for the weather. We recently did clear, we went green for lightning, but we are still violating several constraints. Rain, cumulus crowds, uh, field mills, which is uh, essentially you can tell that the atmosphere is energized around the launch site. We are expecting that we'll possibly clear that. We're going to hear a weather briefing at one hour with the expectation that those conditions may clear shortly afterwards and allow us to move into propellant loading. Also, we've been releasing balloons. What we're seeing at the upper altitudes is conditions look good for Falcon 9 with Dragon. No concerns have been expressed by the GNC uh, guidance team right now. Now, as a reminder, today we have an instantaneous launch window at 4.33.35 Eastern Daylight Saving Time, or just past 33 minutes after the upcoming hour. So we get one chance at it today. But currently, T-minus one hour and three minutes, just passing that. Uh, Falcon 9, Dragon are go. The range is ready to support, but now we're waiting on the weather, as we've been expecting all afternoon. Thanks, John. We've got an extensive history now of flying Falcon 9 from the Florida coast and just last year completed a test run of the mission that we're less than an hour from beginning here today. Yeah, that, the purpose of that mission was to demonstrate Dragon's capability to safely and reliably fly to and from the International Space Station. The success of Demo 1 was a really exciting moment and it paved the way for today's mission where we are just moments away, hopefully if we get that weather, from flying U.S. astronauts from U.S. soil for the first time since 2011.
Dragon and Falcon 9 together have years of operational experience, or what we refer to as flight heritage. As I mentioned earlier, SpaceX has successfully completed 21 flights of Dragon to and from orbit since 2010, including 20 trips to the International Space Station. Not only have we conducted thousands of hours of testing, we've also enhanced and added a number of safety features to Dragon. Much of what was learned with the cargo Dragon was leveraged Dragon in the design SpaceX of this vehicle. Cycling is complete, uh, expected behavior. And wanted to hear if you were able to hear those. We actually did, Jay. We were just uh, making a comment about that. I heard some clicking, and, uh, and Bob watched it on the uh, systems display. So, absolutely. Copy off. And that again, right there. That's the crew talking to the core here in. Uh, Hawthorne, California, who's going to be talking to them throughout their ascent uphill today. So they were just doing a quick checkout. Bob and Doug confirmed they were able to hear it. it sounds like everything's still good, so still no issues with Falcon or Dragon. Back to what we were talking through as we're describing these systems. A lot of what SpaceX did with Cargo Dragon has been leveraged into this Crew Dragon. The vehicle is designed to be fully autonomous, which means it can basically fly itself but it also features a full manual override capability if the crew needs to take control in case of emergency. Many of the other enhancements help towards SpaceX's goal of reusability and less refurbishment time between missions. So let's take a closer look at some of these advancements. Standing at almost 27 feet tall from bottom of the trunk to top of the nose cone, Crew Dragon's composed of two main elements. We have the capsule up top, which is designed to hold the crew and any pressurized cargo, and then an unpressurized section known as the trunk on the bottom. And the nose cone at the top of the capsule protects the docking system as well as the guidance navigation control system, or what we call GNC. The nose cone opens for docking and remains attached to the crew Dragon spacecraft, unlike the previous version of Dragon, that, and that helps towards our reusability efforts. Dragon SpaceX, we are at T-minus one hour. Or go for section six. When ready, report go for launch. SpaceX Dragon will put uh, section six in work. So the crew just has a couple checks, Copy. and when they are ready for launch, we're going to hear them report to the core that they are go for launch. Continuing to walk you through the Dragon spacecraft, opposite of that nose cone is the trunk. We can see it uh, on the left-hand screen there where it's kind of split right down the middle with the left side black and the right side white. Uh, the trunk provides an attachment point to Falcon 9, the Dragon capsule, and can carry any cargo uphill. On the outside, one half of the trunk contains a radiator that rejects heat from the active thermal control system into space using SpaceX's new PICA tiling technology. The other half contains solar cells that are used to charge the spacecraft's batteries during flight. SpaceX Dragon, Bob and I are go for launch. And you heard that call out right Copy. there? Copy, go for launch. Next up will be the go no go full at T minus 45. Bob and Doug are go for launch and next okay, Captain, up. We're holding in step six decimal five. <laughs> You're hearing it live from the Mets. This is amazing, very exciting. The SpaceX is designed the spacecraft is designed to accommodate up to seven crew members with modular seats that can be removed and replaced by additional cargo. The seats are made of carbon fiber and will be custom sized for any crew members flying on board. That control panel that's centered between the pilot and commander seats consists of three touchscreen displays, and that just again allows the crew to operate the vehicle and fly it manually, but also look at all of their procedures, relative position over the earth, the space station, any alarms, alerts, anything that they could possibly want to do on Dragon is through those touchscreens. <laughs> and lastly, our Super Draco launch escape system is a key safety feature of Crew Dragon, giving the crew the ability to safely escape from the time of launch all the way to orbit. And that launch escape system was put into work a little bit earlier this year, again, on that in-flight abort test. As we look to the future beyond this test flight, the first operational SpaceX crewed mission for NASA will be a little bit later this year after Bob and Doug come home. NASA astronauts Mike Hopkins, Victor Glover, and Shannon Walker, and Suichi Noguchi of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, were chosen to support this mission being called Crew-1. 
But today, Doug Hurley is the spacecraft commander for this mission. He previously flew on two space shuttle missions as the pilot on STS-127 and STS-135, which was the final Ready space pull, shuttle pull, 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 flight. Here's a closer look at launch. Doug Hurley. Please review your launch commit criteria. Again, this is uh, to review and confirm a violation of launch commit criteria. We are tracking one issue very with uh, yeah, very weather excited. still. And I think oh, yeah. we'll be to track that ready. all the way down uh, to uh, launch to uh, clear that. This pull is also go for arming and launch escape system and uh, go for propellant load. And this is he on countdown, countdown net reporting that uh, the technical poll was completed. All systems are proceeding. Uh, we are monitoring the weather as LD briefed. We are also looking at a uh, watch item on a hydraulics QD rod ring. Uh, ring pressure will come up at minus 8 minutes 30 seconds, and we'll be able to verify decay rate. No concerns at this time. Everything's reading nominal, uh, but watching that item. Uh, no other constraints on Falcon 9 or ground systems. Stage 2, RP-1 bleed is complete. All right, we just crossed the 55-minute mark away from launch. Sitting right next to Doug Hurley, who's closest to your screen, is NASA astronaut Bob Bankin. He's the net, he is the Joint Operations Commander for Demo-2, and Bankin previously flew on two space shuttle missions, STS-123 and STS-130, and also served a tour as Chief of the Astronaut Office. So here's a little bit more about the man who said testing out a brand new spacecraft is an astronaut's dream. When you go through the, the launch day preparations, there's a lot of moments that, that kind of stand out to you. One is the kind of the celebratory piece of it, which is that you're walking out of the suit up room and uh, getting in the vehicle that's going to take you to the launch pad. When you close the hatch, you know, that's really when Doug and I are in the vehicle and it's our vehicle and, you know, we're really in control of the mission uh, at that point. Test pilots, their task proved that man could fly into orbit around the Earth and return live and well to talk about it. There's always a, a balance of managing risk as you go forward to execute a test point and figuring out a way to you know, collect the data. We hear a sound. OK, is that sound an expected sound? Or we see a light. Is that light an expected light? Um, what's the source of it? Does it sync up with something else that's going on or not? So trying to dissect all of that in real time in your head is, uh, you know, a lot of things happen like that on, a, on launching of a vehicle. From St. Anne, Missouri, he is an Air Force Colonel and flight test engineer. He flew aboard Space Shuttle Endeavor twice, introducing NASA astronaut Bob Bankin. My career at NASA has uh, kind of spanned a, a couple of decades at this point. I, I arrived with the class of 2000. Uh, went through the training program, primarily focused on the space shuttle and the International Space Station, learning those systems. Having uh, launched a couple times on vehicles, you know, the, the second time was definitely different than the first time. You can feel a little bit guilty of, hey, should I study one more thing? Or is there one more piece of information I should get? Am I really prepared or not? Um, so that's definitely different between uh, uh, where I was on my first flight and where I'm at right now. It's been uh, uh, really interesting, I think, for both my wife and I to have gone through the process of seeing each other uh, launch in space. 
I've seen her take that risk and had it be in front of her, and uh, I've done that to her. And there's just something different about watching a rocket launch when there are people on board. You feel a little bit differently about the pit of your stomach, and I can only tell you it's multiplied uh, significantly when it's uh, somebody that you know, and then somebody, of course, that's a family member. It's even multiplied more. For me personally, as a spouse, watching um, everything that Bob has put into this over the last five years, um, the dedication that he's shown, the perseverance is pretty special. For both of us though, the, the way our minds work, it won't be until sort of the mission is complete that you have really a chance to savor it and celebrate it. This is a huge accomplishment for uh, an Air Force flight test engineer to be part of the demonstration mission of a brand new vehicle. It's going to be amazing. Without a, a partner that has that same appreciation, I think it can be challenging for some folks. There's a there's a lot of work and a lot of time that uh, takes away from family that uh, you know that my spouse appreciates, and I love her for that. Really, my role on the Demo Two mission is to make sure that we get this vehicle uh, tested and evaluated so that we can move on to more operational missions at the International Space Station. We've got a lot of objectives uh, on board the uh, vehicle that we need to accomplish to, to really make sure that it's uh, good to go. We'll make sure all those systems are working uh, during the test flight so that the future missions uh, will have them available even if they don't plan to utilize them. Through years of the, the NASA team, um, helping to share that experience and teaching them the lessons that we've learned by going through this, now there's another capability in the U.S. besides NASA to operate something of this magnitude. When is the last time humans launched on a, a new vehicle? Certainly on the, the American side, it's, it's been several decades. Now we're in a time when we've got started. multiple vehicles under development. It's a great time from a, a space exploration time frame just to see all that happening. And it's because of this nurturing of the environment, being able to pull in a, a wider group of people who can contribute towards a human spaceflight. It's just a, it's a super cool time. On a deeply personal uh, level, I, I'm really excited that my son has got to get a chance to see me uh, launch into space. Being an astronaut has been a little bit of a, an abstraction thing for him because he's seen me do it in old videos, uh, but he hasn't seen me do it for real. And so I'm excited for him to see uh, this launch. I want to thank the entire commercial crew program team that's worked together to get to this point where we've got vehicles in the launch pad ready to head to the International Space Station. We're just over 49 and a half minutes away from launch of the Falcon 9 carrying Dragon to the space station. Right now, the launch director and the launch team are preparing for a readiness for launch poll. In this poll, the 13 members of the launch team will electronically indicate a go for launch. This is also the go for propellant load. Now, we're going to hear that in a couple of minutes, so while we wait, we are tracking you watching from all over the country. We're seeing large numbers of you logging on or tuning in from coast to coast, as well as around the world. We want to know, is this your first time watching a launch live? If not, how many have you seen before? Tell us using the hashtag Launch America from your favorite social media website. As for me, this isn't my first one. I've seen a lot, but everyone is exciting. Now, coming up, we're going to go into a readiness poll, as I mentioned. Currently right now on other nets, the SpaceX launch director is checking to verify the Dragon team is ready and that the NASA launch management team is ready. They'll come back uh, at about T minus 47 minutes with instructions to the SpaceX Falcon 9 team to make their final assessments. Then they log into the procedure it's a little different than the old days where you would hear a go, 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 you know, position by position all up and down the row. Uh, in this electronic age, everybody just clicks on uh, whether they're go or no go. The launch director will then at T minus 45 minutes summarize the end of the poll and will then provide instructions for the team. At the same time, we will begin getting ready for the crew access arm retraction and we'll show you that on one of the uh, screens that we've got up. Now, currently, we are continuing to monitor the weather. The weather is still red. It is improving. We're looking at one cell between the radar and the pad. 
Uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed that conditions will improve, but we're going to be watching that for about another 15 minutes. So it looks like we're going to be good to begin propellant load once we hear the poles, but we still have to get the uh, final, get the range green so that we can actually do the launch in just 47 minutes from now. Let's listen to the countdown net for a moment. Right now, coming up on 46 minutes, 10 seconds before launch. Didn't hear any significant shatter coming over countdown one. Yes, launch director to countdown net. Pole is complete, and we have a go to proceed with propellant load. Launch control, proceed with swing into crew arm. Arming crew arm movement for T minus 45 minutes. Thank you, launch control. Reminder in control room on hold and launch escape protocol for not urgent no-go conditions, brief CE or LD, and it will approve aborting the launch auto sequence and proceed to launch abort. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed into the launch abort auto sequence. Operators shall also advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fires imminent or occurring for Dragon manual escape flight rules. Remainder on fire alarm instructions here in fire room four, the event of a fire alarm, key operators previously briefed will remain at their post while the alarm is evaluated. In the event that personal safety is threatened, we will evacuate to the south facing emergency exit, which leads directly outside. One final reminder, we'll be arming the launch escape system momentarily. Need all personnel, please stay in your seats from now through orbit insertion and dragon separation from the second stage. Rear arm retract has started. And you've heard Mike Taylor, the SpaceX launch director, give instructions to the team. We've also just heard the call. The crew access arm retraction is underway. Great view from the camera inside the white room. As we see the arm moving away from the Dragon capsule, one of the major events necessary to get down to T0. The next one coming up will be arming of the escape system on the Dragon capsule. Now, right now, the next plan for Falcon 9, T minus 35 minutes, we will begin loading propellant onto the first and second stages. Now, currently, Falcon 9's looking good. Dragon's looking good. The range continues to be go for launch in terms of the clearance around the uh, launch pad, both the air and the sea space. Looking at the flight corridor, the ground stations, uh, the NASA tracking and data relay satellites are ready to support. And we just continue to monitor the weather. Uh, our team is getting constant updates. We're monitoring uh, weather uh, data sensors around the launch site, looking to make sure that we can get everything into the green position. The one that we're mostly looking at right now is how much rain we're going to get between now and liftoff, uh, whether it's just going to be mild precipitation that's within the uh, rules for loading propellant, uh, that's what the expectation is, but we're going to continue to watch that. So fingers crossed, but right now coming up at uh, T minus 43 minutes, 18 seconds and counting, everything but the weather's go, and the weather is trending in the right direction. So we've got a fingers crossed here. At this time, we're going to send it back over to Kennedy Space Center as the action is picking up on the launch pad. Thanks, John I. Now that countdown clock is continuing to tick and we are 42 minutes and 46 seconds away from launch. Now, as you just saw, the crew arm retracted. That is the last major visual milestone before liftoff. 
and we should be hearing out on the net soon confirmation that the launch escape system is armed. When that happens, all eight of the Super Draco throttle valves are opened, which means that those engines can ignite. For section seven. Okay. So that means those thro those uh, eight uh, throttle valves are opened, and if those Super Dracos needed to fire in order for a Dragon to escape off of the pad, they could. And so things running just a little bit ahead of schedule right now. Field lead is complete. Now we just saw the crew access arm retract just a minute ago. We saw NASA astronauts Doug Hurley. And in uh, seven decimal two, our visors are closed and we're arming the launch escape system. So we just heard the astronauts confirm that they are about to launch, or excuse me, arm the launch escape system. That happens just before fueling begins, which we expect to happen in just a couple of minutes. We saw Bob and Doug suit up a little over three hours ago. Then we watched them drive out to Launch Complex 39A. They were assisted by the SpaceX ground team with Crew Dragon Ingress. That happened a little before 2 o'clock this afternoon. And then we saw the spacecraft hatch close. And again, just a minute ago, we saw the crew access arm retract. We just heard that the crew armed the launch escape system. And in just a few minutes, we are going to uh, hear the call that they have started propellant loading. Launch escape system is verified armed. So we just heard that verification that the launch escape system so is armed. We're switching to Jan 2. And we are going to send it over to Hawthorne. Uh, to take us through prop loading. Jesse? From the parachutes to the launch escape system, SpaceX has de designed Crew Dragon and Falcon 9 to be the safest vehicle, launch vehicle ever flown. And joining us today, we have SpaceX's Nick Pacone, who was our mission manager for our in-flight abort uh, mission earlier this year and currently works on the Starlink team. Thanks for joining us, Nick. Hey, Jesse. I'm here at the Launch and Landing Recovery Center with the recovery team and our Dragon Ground Operations team monitoring the launch. Awesome. Can you tell us more about the critical safety features on this new version of Dragon? Sure. So Dragon 2 was designed with long-term reuse and reliability in mind. So fundamentally, there are multiple layers of redundancy to any of the failure modes that, that we could conceive of, that NASA could conceive of uh, when we were working to design and test this vehicle over the past few years. But in the event that we encounter an unforeseen failure mode or multiple failures which push us outside of our design space, Dragon also has backup systems and operational controls intended to keep Bob and Doug safe. I'm sure you've heard a lot about it today, but the launch escape system is primar the primary uh, backup system that we have from the moment that the vehicle is here on being fueled uh, all the way up until orbital insertion. Um, at a high level, uh, the launch escape system in the event of a major Falcon anomaly or emergency We'll terminate Falcon thrust, separate Dragon from Falcon, and it'll use Dragon's eight Super Draco engines to quickly pull the vehicle away from any kind of Falcon anomaly. And you've talked a lot about the launch escape system. How exactly is that activated? Is it autonomous? Is it manually activated? Definitely. So for this system to work as designed, you have to remember that the vehicle could be flying at hundreds or thousands of miles an hour through the lower atmosphere. So it's really important that it's a extremely fast and highly reliable with very low chance of false positives. Uh, the launch escape system fundamentally is set to look at a set of pre-programmed criteria which are on board the vehicle. Dragon and Falcon are looking at high rate telemetry, um, looking for a normal vehicle dynamics, loss of communication between critical systems um, or manual commanding. Our launch director and chief engineer who you've heard a lot from today are capable of sending a manual command uh, to Dragon to initiate a launch escape, and Bob and Doug are also always able to uh, to actuate the launch escape handle and, and initiate a launch escape themselves as well. Um, now that the system is armed, um, all of this is currently active on the vehicle. 
Wow, it sounds like there's a lot that goes into it. And we did have an in-flight abort test earlier this year to test this out. Can you tell us what we learned from that test? Definitely. Uh, it was possibly the, the most flight-like test of an orbital class booster um, in history. Uh, it was a fully flight-like test using a full Falcon 9 rocket, which we had to knowingly destroy um, in order to get this fully integrated system. Um, for folks who didn't get a chance to see it, uh, the vehicle followed a normal crew launch trajectory about a minute and a half into flight. Uh, we had Dragon autonomously trigger the launch escape system based on a, a reconfiguration of those triggers I was just talking about. For um, and thankfully, we had... Uh, we, uh, we continued through flight, um, had a successful parachute deployment and splashdown, um, and we did see Falcon rather spectacularly blow up um, about 10 seconds after separation. Um, it's uh, important to recognize that all of that happens uh, from command to actual separation of the vehicle in under half a second. Wow, yeah, that sounds amazing. Thank you so much, Nick, for joining us and talking through those details with us. Enjoy the launch today. So we're gonna send it back to KSC with Lauren. Thank you, Jesse. We are about a minute and a half away from propellant load. At T minus 35 minutes, we should hear the call out on the nets that propellant load has started. So that's about a minute and 13 seconds away. Hey, Marie and Lauren, I am getting goosebumps over here. This is uh, an exciting moment. Uh, when I was sitting in the vehicle, when we retracted everything, when all the load, the prop was getting loaded up, I was just uh, going through my crew notebook. I was thinking about, you know, what my first step would be if there was a malfunction, because usually everything goes normally when you fly to space, but you have to think about the things that you have to take care of, you know, the first steps you have to take care of. And on my mission, I was calling out the abort calls, like if we had lost an engine, where would we go next, when the different abort calls around the country and around the world. So I think that's what those guys are probably thinking about now, and uh, just really getting ready for this, this mission to go, go off. Absolutely, and we're just now about 20 seconds from when we expect propellant loading to start. Again, that's fueling of the rocket. All right, we're getting close. We should hear that call out any second now on the nets, so let's listen in. Propellant load has started. Fantastic. So prop load has started. We've started loading liquid oxygen on stage one and stage two. Um, and yeah, liquid oxygen and RP1, which is our rocket grade kerosene. So now that we are 34 minutes and 42 seconds away from the first launch of astronauts into orbit from American soil since 2011, we know that the launch escape system is armed, which happened just before fueling. Dragon prop load happened weeks ago, actually just a few miles, miles down the road at what we call Dragon Land. And those propellants, which are MMH or monomethyl hydrogen, that's our fuel, and NTO, or nitrogen tetraoxide, that's our oxidizer, uh, those not only feed the Draco engines that propel Dragon on orbit, but they also supply those eight super, eight super Draco engines of the launch escape system. So I have one right here, a little model. Um, oh, it doesn't come off the stand. <laughs> Don't break it, Lauren. All right, I, I know, it's very nice. Uh, so uh, as you can see, we, Dragon is actually broken up into four quads, and each quad has two of the Super Draco engines for a total of eight of them. And as I mentioned, they are uh, biprop engines. They have MMH and NTO as their oxidizer. Um, now, most abort systems from past space vehicles, uh, I believe like Soyuz, Mercury, Apollo, they all had an, a pointy escape tower on top where there was essentially like a mini rocket engine or a series of rocket engines on top. And if they weren't used, those that, that escape tower would have to jettison itself from the vehicle. If it was used, it would be used to lift the vehicle off of the rocket. Well, Dragon is a little bit different in that its escape system is actually integrated into the vehicle. And that's great for a couple of reasons. One, uh, one less thing you have to jettison on a nominal flight. Right. Um, and so they're pretty dormant, just those throttle valves open unless they're used and hopefully they never have to be. Um, and yeah, I mean, the other thing that that offers you is the ability to escape from the pad all the way to orbit. Right. Because if you jettisoned your escape system prior to that, you couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, 
That's that's a little dragon there. Again, right. new era, much safer design. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for walking us through that, Lauren. Again, the launch escape system is armed. Um, that protects Bob and Doug so that if something were to go wrong, they can shoot off of the pad away from the rocket and parachute to safety in the ocean. Um, that is such a crucial safety capability. And so now we want to go over to Hawthorne for an operational update with John. Thanks, Marie. We are counting down those final minutes. Everything is still looking good on the Falcon 9 and the Dragon vehicles for an on-time launch, but weather is trending the wrong way right now. And we're keeping our ears open in case we hear that uh, the weather is going to be no go for the rest of the count. Right now, we are counting down at T minus 32 minutes. Stage one locks Falcon and Falcon 9 did begin propellant load at T minus 35 minutes, right on time. The propellants we use on Falcon 9 are a fuel, which is rocket-grade kerosene, also called RP-1, refined petroleum. We use an oxidizer, and that's the super chill liquid oxygen, or LOX as we call it. Those two propellants with, you know, come together, but they don't light, so we need an ignition source to complete the fire triangle. For this, Falcon 9 uses a fluid called T-TUB. You might see that just before first stage ignition or maybe later in the second stage ignition. You get a green colored flame as the T-tub comes out into the oxygen and that ignites the main engines right before the rocket takes off or the second stage engine lights. Now currently in the fueling, RP-1 fuel is about 10% full on the first stage. That's the bottom two thirds of the stack of the vehicle you can see on the left. The first stage is that long white cylinder at the bottom plus that black cylinder called the inner stage. That's the entire first stage that we're loading with LOX and RP-1 kerosene. That's the part that comes back to Earth. The second stage just above it, the white cylinder, and then above that will be the Dragon trunk and the capsule. Now currently the second stage is also loading fuel with RP-1. That's about 8% uh, full right now. We are loading liquid oxygen on the first stage. The second stage liquid oxygen load will begin at T minus 16 and a half minutes if the weather cooperates. So LOX loading will then continue on both the first and second stage until the last few minutes of the countdown. Helium loading is also underway into pressure vessels on the first second stage. We use that to pressurize the tanks in flight as the propellant is being pulled out by the Merlin turbo pumps. Dragon on board the spacecraft. You can see the astronauts are monitoring systems while propellant is loaded into the Falcon 9. Now when we Stage flew one, the first started. demo flight last year and then the in-flight escape test earlier this year, the sounds inside the Dragon capsule were recorded. So as part of the training, the sounds of the propellant loading were played back to acclimate the crew to what they're experiencing now. I'm stopping, I'm listening to some discussion on one of the back nets, uh, trying to track uh, where we are with the weather criteria. Uh, we're just passing another weather gate right now, uh, trying to see whether or not the conditions are go. Uh, in certain situations, when the weather is no go, you have to wait 30 minutes, and we are now inside of 30 minutes. But if the cloud moves away, if the conditions improve, uh, we may be able to continue the countdown for another 14 minutes and reassess. So we're waiting to see whether or not uh, we can continue the count. Currently we are. The range, they're ready to support with no problems uh, in the air and the sea space area. Uh, but again, the weather, that's the one that's looking bad and we're gonna continue to listen. And as a reminder, today we have an instantaneous launch time. So at this point, if we hear a hold for any reason, we're going to have to stand down and target our backup launch opportunity on May 30th. For demo two, Bob and Doug's flight to station will take about 19 hours and their journey is fairly similar to the trip our cargo dragon makes back and forth to the International Space Station with two noticeable differences, docking and splashdown. As we await T minus zero in just a little over 28 minutes from now, ground operations teams just doing those final series of system checks, making sure both Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready for liftoff and really keeping an eye on that weather. And you're just continuing to get live views of the teams. You've got Falcon 9 and Dragon on your left and then Bob and Doug on the right as they prepare at the Cape for liftoff. 
Once we hit T0 and a successful launch occurs, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon make their ascent until Falcon 9 and first and second stages separate and send Dragon on its way to the space station. And once it gets on orbit, mission operators will prepare Dragon for on-orbit operations, where Dragon will execute a series of burns that are going to gradually raise its orbit to align more closely with the International Space Station. And you're seeing some of that track in the animation on your screen right now. After doing enough of these burns, they'll put Dragon... Oh, sounds like we're going to get a weather update real quick for the crew. Go ahead, SpaceX. Yeah, we're currently just evaluating uh, one constraint, a constraint on the field mill rule, which looks at lightning energy dissipation. Um, we expect to have an update at about T minus 20, and uh, more information there on whether we would be able to continue into the prop load or, or scrub at that time. Okay, Jay, thanks for the update. We appreciate it. Copy. So I'll give you some more words in about six minutes. Okay, so it sounds like we're going to find out in about six minutes if we're going to have enough time. And John, I was referring to a couple of those weather situations where we have to have a, a certain amount of time. In this case, uh, with the field mills, about 15 minutes. So they have until about 16 minutes and 30 seconds to really make sure that we're going to have enough time for that to dissipate. So we're going to be listening for that weather update in just a couple of minutes. But it is going to be a pretty interesting trip uphill for them once they actually get on orbit. <laughs> and a very exciting countdown with six minutes to figure out if we are launching today. But t targeting back to what we were talking about, next will Dragon will make its approach and actually dock with the space station. This is a very different process from what we've seen with Dragon cargo deliveries in the past, which used a process called berthing. Now, berthing requires a spacecraft to approach the station and then stop so a crew member can maneuver the station's robotic arm to capture the spacecraft. Docking on this version of Dragon can be done autonomously. Stage two cryohelium load started. Autonomously with no crew aboard the station. It's typically a faster process, both when arriving and leaving, but it does still require pinpoint accuracy to approach safely. Once captured, a spacecraft then gets attached to a common berthing mechanism. It's the same type of port that we use to connect each of the modules together on board station. It's a little bit slower process than docking, but the hatches are significantly larger than docking ports, which makes them perfect for bringing up large cargo items. Dragon will spend up to 120 days docked before preparing to return home. Following successful completion of Dragon's test objectives and cargo loading operations, the crew will close out the cabin, perform final system checks, and configure the vehicle for undocking. Once the automated undocking sequence is complete, Dragon will complete two departure burns using its Draco engines, pushing it away from the space station. And then after Dragon departs the station, it's ready for its trip home. And that'll have deorbit entry and landing and a number, number of other operations. If you're looking at this animation, it might look like we're playing the one we played originally in reverse because that's kind of how it goes, but just a little bit quicker. Uh, all of the operations following the final departure maneuver will include things like trunk separation, closing that nose cone again, executing a deorbit burn, and once they're inside the atmosphere, deploying drogue and then main parachutes and then finally splashing down off the Florida coast, at which team time teams will move in, get Bob and Doug up out of the water, and get them out of the capsule once they're on the boat. So we have four minutes now until we get that next expected weather update. Well, let's go down now to the team at Kennedy. Murray? All right, thanks, Dan. If you're just joining us, we are now T-minus 23 minutes and 48 seconds from the first launch of astronauts to the International Space Station from U.S. soil in nine years. We're going to find out in less than four minutes if the weather looks good for that. Um, and this will mark the beginning of a new era where more people will be able to fly to space than ever before. Um, in fact, we took a poll a little bit earlier to ask you if you had the opportunity to fly to space, would you go? And 86% of those of you watching answered that you would go to space. That's an incredible number. I think, you know, realizing that you don't have to be a military astronaut or a NASA astronaut to fly in space. You can be a regular civil, you know, just a regular person going off to space on a SpaceX type rocket. So I think that's why the numbers are so high. Yeah, and, and we are really thrilled to uh, to see all the folks uh, watching along online. I know we certainly hope that uh, that this is a go, but we're again, we're going to hear a little bit of a weather update in less than three minutes now. 
And Leland, you know, I know they're waiting for a weather update and they've come, you know, almost all the way down the count. What do you think Bob and Doug are thinking about right now? You know, we uh, on 120, SES 129, we were having some weather problems and I think we were getting close to the countdown and then it seemed like the sky just cleared up right above our heads. We saw it and we knew we were going. And, you know, we always know that, you know, you can have any types of delays, fuel prop delays, all kinds of things that can happen. But we've trained over and over and over again for these types of scenarios. And so, you know, we want to be safe. We want to be safe for our families. And uh, we'll, you know, do this another day if it doesn't work with the weather. I love that John I always says weather. It's that thing that everybody talks about, but no one can do anything about it. <laughs> and it is this interesting thing of just, you know, succumbing to, right. to Mother Earth. She's going to tell us if we can go or not today. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, if it happens, I mean, look at it this way. Bob and Doug got one really great rehearsal in, right? <laughs> it's always best to practice and practice and practice, yes. So again, we're less than two minutes now from that weather update that uh, is going to go directly to Bob and Doug, and we will quiet down so we can listen in for that because I know we can't wait to find out what that is. And uh, those of you watching that have been following along, um, we are eagerly awaiting to hear um, whether the weather is going to be a showstopper today. Clouds can seem really deceiving at times, right? You see the blue skies peeking through and you think everything's fine, but you just don't know. That's Absolutely. why we have those launch weather officers. Absolutely. And I know, you know, we've talked about it before, but it's not just the weather in Florida that they're looking at. They've got to look at weather downrange. If they if they were to have an abort um, in flight and they needed to come down somewhere in the, in the ocean, uh, they need to consider what the weather's like out there because recovery teams have to go out and get them in a situation like that. So there's so many variables, um, and that's why um, not just with this flight, but, you know, with every human space flight we've had in the past, there's always a very good chance of, of a scrub because, because you do have so much criteria that you have to meet. And we're going to listen in now. We're just seconds away from a weather update. Stage 2, RP1 load complete. That is liquid oxygen you see venting off the rocket. That's completely normal and expected. We're standing by for a weather update. Um, unless you can give us another uh, 10 minutes, I don't think we're going to get there uh, with any of the rules today. I'm going to give you 10 minutes. I mean, <laughs> another 10 minutes past T0. Oh, 1640, like 1645 local, I think we'll probably be clear on all the rules, but uh, not quite, not quite going to make it for this. Okay. We're going to check back in with you in about two minutes, and then I'll call it up at about uh, 17 minutes. Okay. Yeah, we got we, – there's some of them are starting to count down, but we still have one above 2,000. So if that gets below – And that didn't sound great right there. That was the weather net going out, but we're still standing by for a final decision. And we're going to continue to listen in for an update. But in the meantime, we're going to go over to John Innsbrucker at SpaceX headquarters in California. John? 
and Dragon SpaceX on weather. Uh, we're still T not minus 18 good minutes currently. and counting. Uh, LD is, we uh, are still, still red on weather. Uh, expect an update from LD. We're waiting in about uh, another in minute for one final check with weather. We're going to check at okay, T minus 17 copy. minutes possibly. We don't really expect that things will have improved. Uh, the weather officer was not optimistic that uh, the weather would clear up that rapidly. We did hear the launch director, Mike T Taylor, joke that. You know, if we uh, could move uh, 10 more minutes uh, past the T0, weather conditions may improve, but Mike was not able to do that. We have an instantaneous window today. So at 17 minutes, we want to make that call because shortly after that, we will begin loading liquid oxygen onto the second stage. So if we're not going to have the opportunity to launch, launch if the clock's going to run out, that. stand by. We continue to violate a couple different weather rules that now do not expect to clear in time to allow for a launch today. we go ahead and end uh, today's launch attempt. Launch control. Go ahead and the launch auto sequence and proceed into the launch abort auto sequence, please. Launch abort has started. And Dragon SpaceX, unfortunately, um, we are not going to launch today. You are go for 5.100 launch scrub. 5.100, it was a good effort by the teams, and we understand, and we'll uh, meet you there. Copy all. We've heard the call from the crew. They have been informed. Launch Director Mike Kaler uh, has called a scrub for the day. And we got the feedback when uh, the Dragon team informed uh, Bob and Doug. They said we gave it a good try, what they understand, and uh, we are here to try another day. So right now we did uh, officially hold the clock. It looks like at T-minus 16 minutes, 54 seconds. The launch automatic sequence that controls the Falcon 9, the loading of propellants, the cycling of valves, that is also stopped. We now proceed into what is a normal scrub sequence for us. We practice this every launch. So now we move into safely taking the propellants, the pressurization gases back off the first and second stages. As things get into a safe configuration, then we will uh, disarm the escape system on Dragon, and we'll bring the crew access arm back around the uh, spacecraft. So right now, we got down to just inside 17 minutes. The hardware was working very well on both Dragon and spacecraft. We had the uh, fuel loading going on. We had liquid oxygen loading going on, everything but the second stage. And the weather just needed a little bit more time to clear the conditions. We didn't have that time because we had an instantaneous window. And so with that, SpaceX launch director had to call upon the input from okay, weather. Dragon, copy had to call about 30 minutes. Thank for you, the day for the safety rules that we have for this flight. So right now the team is undergoing the uh, post scrub operations on both Dragon uh, as well as Falcon 9, working with the range. No issues being reported right now as we start to go through that sequence. Everything looks good. And uh, Dan, uh, we had a we had a good uh, webcast going here until the very end, so uh, you know we'll look at it as uh, now we've had another great uh, dry rehearsal. Last Saturday we did a dry one, I should say, and today we've done a wet dress rehearsal. But sorry, we just couldn't get there, Dan. Yeah, thanks, John. I and obviously we can't control the weather. We came right down to the wire there, hoping we could just squeeze in between those cloud systems to get a launch today, but. It wasn't to be, um, but it doesn't mean this we're done. We're going to have another attempt coming up in just three days. So we're going to be doing this all over again, essentially on Saturday uh, on the 30th. And that launch attempt is going to be coming at 322 p.m. Eastern time. So a little bit earlier in the day, it's going to look largely the same to everything that we saw today with the crew waking up, going through suit up, making their way to the pad. So it's going to we're going to feel a lot of deja vu, I think, on Saturday. Um, but still exciting. Uh, safety is always first. So if weather was not there for us today, hopefully Saturday it will be there for us and we will have a safe launch on Saturday.
Yeah, the initial weather report still had us at about, I think, a 40% uh, possibility of violation. So weather a little bit better, but we're still going to be kind of rolling the dice. It is Florida in the spring and summer, so storms are always a possibility. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, one of the good things, though, the vehicle appeared to be in great health throughout the day, both Dragon and Falcon 9, so we didn't have to scrub for any technical issue. We're going to continue and follow along with Bob and Doug until they're out of that capsule, as, again, they had started loading fuel onto the Falcon 9 rocket, so they'll have to wait until all that fuel comes off. They'll disarm the launch escape system, which still stays armed because they're still sitting on an, a partially loaded rocket, and then once they're able to disarm that launch escape system, the crew arm will swing back out, They'll make their way once again back the way they came, and then we'll be back to crew quarters for Bob and Doug for a few more days. But if you're just now tuning in wondering why we're not still counting down, we did have a launch scrub today. We were just a little under Stage 17 one minutes. Stage fuel flow rates are nominal or offload. Expecting about a 40 minute offload time. And so that call out the, the locks, the liquid oxygen fuel pumping out of the first stage of the Falcon 9, everything looking good with that. Expecting about 40 minutes for all that fuel to come off. So, again, once that fuel comes off, Bob and Doug will be able to disarm the launch escape system, and that crew access arm will swing back out. And they'll be able to make their way back down and then over to crew quarters. So, Unfortunate scrub today because of weather. That was the one thing we were tracking from the moment we started today, uh, watching Bob and Doug get suited up for their launch. Uh, we did abort today's launch or scrub today's launch uh, with a little under 17 minutes to go until our T0 time, which was 4.33. So that's going to move us to our next attempt, which is coming up on Saturday. And that time is going to be uh, 3.22 p.m. Eastern time, so a little bit early earlier in the day for Bob and Doug and for everybody else watching around the world. They're still going to have a 19-hour flight to station if that's when we launch. And a lot of the stuff that we saw today is going to look very similar. But we're just going to have to try again, cross our fingers, hope for a little bit weather, better weather the next <laughs> time. And again, this goes with every launch. We do track everything all the way down to T0 to make sure that everything is go, making sure that the range is go weather is go. So this is standard procedure. Um, we always tend to make sure that we have a backup day, launch day, in case we do yep. have scrubs like today. So this is this is pretty normal and standard. Um, nothing to be worried about. Again, we do this for the safety of our vehicles as well as today we had astronauts on our vehicle. So even bigger reason for us to make sure that we have safe weather for them to fly. And just a reminder for everyone still tuned in, it takes about 40 minutes for all of this propellant to come off of the Falcon 9. And while it is offloading that launch escape system on Dragon, which is designed to pull the capsule away, if there's any issue with the rocket or anything on the pad, that is still armed. So we're going to continue to stay with this until all the propellants off and then we'll see the launch escape system get disarmed bob and doug will be able to open up their visors again the launch uh, the crew access arm will swing back out and link up with dragon and they'll make their way off and then down the uh, tower at the pad but if you're just now tuning in no launch today we did have to scrub because of weather we're going to be moving to our second attempt on saturday just a little bit earlier in the afternoon just going to continue to stand by as this propellant comes off. We heard a call that everything was going nominally or as expected so far. And then once the, all the propellants off, we should see Bob and Doug make their way out of Dragon shortly after. And what you're seeing on your screen is a live view of Bob and Doug on the right side inside of Dragon as they're waiting for propellant to be removed from the vehicle so that it is safe for them to disarm the launch escape system. And this will take uh, a bit of time, so we are going to stay live with you to watch this uh, as they exit the vehicle eventually 
um, and come down from from standing down on launch today. Up until the point of the scrub, we had a really clean countdown. weren't tracking any issues with Falcon 9 or the Dragon spacecraft, so always a good thing to see. We did have to scrub because of that weather. Uh, to be a little bit more specific, we were still in violation of one of the weather criteria. It was the strength of electric fields in the atmosphere that uh, the 45th Space Wing and other weather operators are monitoring around the launch pad. And that's one of those rules where we need a certain amount of time if we're in a violation in this case. Nominal, roughly 50% on stage one locks and fuel, 85% on stage two fuel. So the propellant offload on Falcon 9 continuing to go well. Uh, but we needed a little bit more time if we were going to be able to clear that launch weather constraint. And since we do have an instantaneous launch window today, we weren't able to make it. So. We hope for better weather coming up on Saturday, where again, our next launch attempt is going to be at 3.22 p.m. Eastern time, and we'll be able to go through everything. I mean, we, we saw them get suited up. They had a great ride out to the pad. All of their initial checks on both the suits with pressure checks and communication checks went well, able to get the Dragon hatch closed, the launch escape system arm, and Falcon 9 started its fueling, just not able to make a good weather window today. And as John I said earlier, it was just another great rehearsal today. Um, I don't think you can get uh, enough practice doing this. So when Saturday comes or when we, the day that we can actually launch the vehicle, Bob and Doug and the NASA and SpaceX team are fully prepared with just an extra rehearsal on the belt now. <laughs> And as we had talked a couple of times throughout our countdown, the weather is a lot more complex when we're launching humans. You have some more stringent uh, requirements in place, uh, not only around the pad, but uh, in the case of this launch today, we we're also looking at whether the entire ascent corridor, as we call it, so basically the entire way that they were flying up the east coast of the United States in this launch today, we're monitoring that weather because those are areas that if they have an ascent abort or basically Dragon firing off of the Falcon 9 while they're flying into space, we have to make sure that conditions are good in the sea states around those areas just so they're not going to be landing in the middle of a hurricane, which we did have a tropical storm forming right <laughs> off the coast uh, of South Carolina today just to help complicate things a little bit. <laughs> And people might be asking, if we knew the weather was going to be a little iffy today, why continue to count down? Um, well, that is the reason why we do all these checks all the way to count down. Uh, in Florida, the weather is, you know, pretty sporadic. Uh, sometimes a, a thunderstorm or hurricane will pass through. Within 20 minutes, it's gone, and we could have clear skies for a safe launch. Um, so as we continued as scheduled. Um, standard procedure again to just continuing to continue to monitor weather all the way down to the last minutes of the count and uh, we see what happens so today unfortunately we did scrub for weather uh, but we will attempt again this Saturday on May 30th And uh, Dan, Jesse, uh, a couple of things to add on there. Uh, right now we are 11 minutes after the scrub was called. Uh, liquid oxygen and fuel are coming off of the first stage. Uh, hard to tell from the view. Uh, it's still a little misty around the tank because there's locks on board. But we're uh, between half and a third of each of the fuel and locks tanks uh, filled on the first stage. So uh, propellant coming out uh, right per plan. The second stage fuel tank is offloading. That's going slower, but it's also a smaller tank. It doesn't take very long to either load it or to offload it. The other thing that we're working on is the high pressure helium spheres, uh, as well as the nitrogen spheres for the uh, landing leg system. Uh, the pressure will be brought down on those, eventually getting it down low enough uh, to where uh, people can re-enter the pad area. So right now the team is preparing once they get a uh, permission the uh, SpaceX uh, ingress egress technician team uh, will come back inside the uh, uh, caution area around the pad make their way up uh, when conditions are right open up the hatch and assist the astronauts uh, out of the dragon I'd like to point out that uh, for those who are wondering whether or not having gone through this putting propellant pressurization gases on 
getting fairly close to launch. Whether that has done anything to wear out the Falcon 9 or the Dragon, uh, the answer is no. If you can recall, the Falcon 9 is designed for at least 10 flights, and about time we get up to a 10th flight, we'll be doing testing to find that we probably got enough uh, margin to continue keep flying. So this is the very first flight of a new first stage and a new second stage. So we've not, uh, we haven't even gotten through the first flight. And in all of our margin calculations, we also take into account the fact that we may scrub a launch. So even today's operation where we have pressurized and we have stressed the vehicle a little bit, uh, that's taken into account in our design and our qualification testing. The other good thing is that the uh, most stressing part uh, of the flight for uh, the Falcon 9 on the first stage is the reentry. So we didn't even get through that. So we're sitting here on the pad. Uh, it's a fairly uh, uh, straightforward situation and not stressing on the Falcon 9. And on the Dragon spacecraft, with the human rating factors to carry crew, uh, there is enough uh, factors of safety, margins of safety, redundancy, that uh, just having two people on board and closing the hatch uh, and even pressurizing the propellant system uh, does not eat into the margins of the Offloads continue nominally, 30% on stage one. So right now everything's continuing to offload. Uh, the automatic sequences that uh, we use routinely, both at the launch sites, uh, Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral, even Vandenberg Air Force Base, as well as in our Texas test site for first and second stage, those sequences are running. Propellant is coming off of the vehicle uh, per plan. And uh, we see uh, Bob and Doug uh, up in the uh, Dragon spacecraft, uh, just waiting uh, when we can get up there, open the hatch, and help them egress and come on back down the tower. And the other thought I had, uh, Dan and uh, Jesse, is uh, right now we are coming up uh, uh, on what would have been uh, T0. And I'm wondering 10 minutes from now whether the weather officer would turn around and say, yes, it turned good. You just didn't have a long enough window. We only had one second and we needed 10 minutes. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to ask offline and say, hey, did the uh, weather conditions improve? And one thing I'll tag on to that Dan was mentioning and Jesse was talking about the launch opportunities. The launch window does move earlier on Saturday a little bit. So it just happened to be Orbital Dynamics said today, if you want to go to the International Space Station and you want to launch northeast, which is the approved trajectory, you have to go right at 4.33, 35 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time. You pick another day, the T0 moves. Uh, it's just uh, luck of the draw. We might have been doing this at eight in the morning when we were getting lightning or we could have been doing it uh, a few hours from now when conditions may have been acceptable. So in the end, uh, we can all look at uh, Isaac Newton and Johannes Kepler for orbital dynamics telling us when do we launch and that stuck us right in the middle of a period of bad weather. So there's, there's my science lesson for today, Dan and Jesse. <laughs> Appreciate that, John. That helps soften the blow of just moving <laughs> past that T minus zero time. Uh, but for anybody, if you're just now tuning in, wondering why Falcon 9 is still sitting there on the pad as we move past that T0, we did have a scrub for weather today, uh, just not able to clear all of those constraints. We, we keep a very close eye on the weather around the pad and our, their whole way Dragon up SpaceX hill. for weather. Right now, Bob and Doug are still inside. Like Dragon, Dragon, go ahead for weather. Yeah, I just wanted to give you some more words on the scrub uh, rationale. Yeah, so we basically scrubbed due to three rules that we were violating. Uh, both, all three would have been expected to clear 10 minutes after our T0 time. And those three were natural lightning, the field mills, and the attached anvil. Yeah, we copy, Jay. We appreciate that uh, update. We can see some uh, raindrops on the windows and uh, just figured that uh, whatever it was was too close to the launch pad at uh, the time we needed it not to be. So uh, we appreciate that and understand that everybody's probably uh, 
a little bit bummed out. It's just part of the deal. Everybody was ready today, and we appreciate that. And uh, the ship was great. And uh, we'll do it again, uh, I think, on Saturday. Copy all. And yeah, we concur. And appreciate your resilience uh, sitting there in the vehicle for us. We got the easy job. Nothing better than being prime crew on a new spaceship. Copy that. All right, some, some great words from Bob and Doug. They're feeling good inside Dragon. They'll be ready to go when we make our next attempt on Saturday. Uh, right now, we're just still waiting for all of the fuel to come off the Falcon 9 rocket. After Stay that, unlocks and fuel roughly 20%. Stage two fuel, 36%. And so that call right there, we're still at a little over 20% on fuel, RP1 and LOX, liquid oxygen on the first stage, and then at about 26% on RP1 on that second stage. So again, it takes about 40 minutes once the process starts. So we should have right around 30 minutes or so until all that fuel's off. And then uh, the crew will get the go to disarm the launch escape system. We'll see that crew access arm swing back into place and they can begin to egress or get out of the Dragon spacecraft. And you heard it live, that weather update of what we violated. We were just 10 minutes off, unfortunately, but again, today was an instantaneous launch. Um, and as John explained, um, it's due to the orbital mechanics and, and making sure that at the time we launch, it will allow us to get to the space station on time and accurately. So you can see on your right screen, Bob and Doug are patiently waiting. They do still have their visors on and still strapped into their seats. The launch escape system is still armed right now as we are offloading fuel and will not disarm until prop offload is complete and this is just to ensure the safety of Bob and Doug and make sure that they can egress safely from the rocket. And just a reminder today just this first attempt we're going to be right back here uh, looking like on Saturday for attempt number two launch America is not going anywhere <laughs> still still on the track to get Bob and Doug into space get this crew dragging up to the International Space Station. So it's always it's always good if you're going to scrub, probably rather scrub for weather than an issue on either Falcon 9 or Dragon. And we weren't tracking any issues with the flight systems throughout our countdown today. Everything passed with leak checks on the hatches and the crew suits. All the communications working great. All the teams were ready to go. So as John and I said, always nice to have a little bit more practice and we'll be right <laughs> back at it on Saturday. <laughs> what would this launch be if it wasn't even more exciting to try and launch today and now we have to push it to Saturday? You really got to build the suspense. <laughs> yes. So. Hey, Dan and Jesse. Uh, another thought crossed my uh, mind while I'm watching uh, the diagram here showing fuel is just about off first and second stage. We're down under 10%. Uh, LOX is also just about off of the uh, uh, first stage. Yep, we're getting the announcement. Two stage two fuels at 20%, stage one LOX is under 10%. So just continu continuing to come off of the vehicle uh, as expected. Uh, on the monitor, uh, Bob and Doug continue with visors down. Their launch escape system is armed, as we've mentioned. Uh, if there is anything that we're happening to go wrong right now, they still have the viable pad abort means something that we demonstrated way back in 2015 on one of these webcasts when we fired the Dragon capsule using the eight Super Dracos off of the launch pad and it splashed down offshore in the Atlantic Ocean. So they're staying there with the system armed until all the hazards are essentially removed and we bring the uh, crew access arm around them. We're standing by a minute. We're going to listen to launch director talking to the weather officer. And 
If you're just now tuning in, we did not launch today. We did have a scrub because of weather. But if, as we were saying, we are looking forward to trying this again on Saturday. Our launch time on Saturday will be another instantaneous window, so we'll have to have the weather cooperate again. And that launch time will be at 3.22 p.m. Eastern. I think our last weather update put us at about 40% probability of violation. John, I can check me real quick. Yeah, Dan, what I saw coming out of the Air Force was 40% uh, probability of violation, I believe. It's always tough because they report in terms of violation, and the optimists have to subtract that from 100% to go, hey, 60% chance, I'll plan my picnic. <laughs> uh, we were listening, uh, the uh, SpaceX launch director, Mike Taylor, was talking to the uh, launch weather officer asking about the three criteria that scrubbed us today. It sounds like in another minute or two, the lightning and the attached anvil uh, cloud rules will clear. The field so mill rule charge in the blocks, atmosphere uh, is still bouncing here. around, and so, hey, we may need uh, you know, several more minutes before that one would clear. So we'd need even longer than 10 minutes in the window today, it looks like, for all the rules to clear. That brings up uh, what I wanted to uh, mention a little while ago. Uh, I got lost uh, listening to the weather brief. Uh, but there are a lot of folks who are going, why an instantaneous launch window for Falcon 9 and Dragon? Now, typically when we go to the space station, when we do the mission planning, it's an instantaneous window. Uh, there may be enough performance in the rocket to launch uh, somewhere in a five minute period, but you've got to pick a time in there. But in the case of Falcon 9, once we start propellant load at T minus 35 minutes, it doesn't matter so much uh, if you can move five or ten minutes left or right because the whole sequence is scripted we do the flight analysis assuming that the temperatures of the propellants are below a certain amount so that we know how much performance is available to the rocket how much margin we're going to have so essentially if you start the countdown you know four hours eight hours out like we we're doing today and you have uh, a very short window once you get into propellant loading at t-minus 35 minutes you have to go as soon as you get to zero. We don't have the ability to stop the countdown, wait five minutes. Uh, now all of a sudden the liquid oxygen starts warming up from 340 degrees below zero in the ground system. And that changes how much performance uh, you get carrying into orbit. And we don't want to cut into those margins. Now, if we had had something like a four hour window, which some uh, communication satellites have, we could actually get down to almost zero hold the count, detank the Falcon 9, wait a while, it takes us about an hour and a half, reload a whole new batch of cold liquid oxygen and fuel from the big storage tank that we've got there at pad 39A and try to launch again. But in that case, you have to be able to launch, you know, about an hour and a half or so later after you scrub. And in the case of the International Space Station, an hour and a half from now, it's nowhere near where we need to be uh, to Dragon get to Space orbit with the performance of the Falcon 9 and the Dragon. So today it's a combination. We start the day with Dragon, a, a one second window, yeah, just you, uh, it's but once we get inside of 35 minutes, uh, so it becomes in an instantaneous level. window for the Falcon and 9, for awareness, regardless uh, of what the uh, customer may be able to give us. So there's a little explanation for folks who are wondering why we have such a tight window. Okay, right now, it looks like we uh, are uh, bringing the last bits uh, of fuel off of the stage, and liquid expect, oxygen so think, is just know, about off of the stage. Stuff, so things are uh, clocking right along for the 40-minute timeline. Uh, everything looks good, and we'll wait to uh, hear that we're clear, and then when we get the call for Bob and Doug to go ahead and disarm launch escape system and the crew access arm, we'll watch come back out, center itself around the Dragon hatch, and then the Ingress team will go up there and uh, open the hatch. Thank you for the science lesson, John I. Ah, <laughs> uh, hey, no charge. <laughs> <laughs> Much we, appreciated. <laughs> we did hear a quick call to the crew there. We should be just under 10 minutes away from that prop load, prop offload completing. It looks like we're just tracking Stage uh, two, the RP-1. Offload is complete. And there we, we have the confirmation stage two offloads complete. And we should have now just the RP-1, so that densified uh, propellant, or the uh, RP-1 is kerosene. Uh, we should be under 10%, a little under 10 minutes until that's off. And then we'll step through those events we were discussing. 
where they'll be able to disarm the launch escape system, get the arm back out there, and Bob and Doug can begin to exit the Dragon spacecraft. Still not the friendliest skies in the background. <laughs> that is Florida, though. The weather is constantly changing over there, which is why we always have to keep an eye on it through every single launch that we have out there. Bob and Doug are patiently waiting. As you can see, that is a live view of them on the Crew Dragon vehicle as they're waiting prop offload to complete. Second stage. Prop offload is complete. We are just waiting on first stage to stage complete. Stage one, box offload is complete. Waiting on stage one fuel, roughly five minutes or so. And again, the launch escape system is still armed. We are waiting for a prop offload to complete before they disarm that, and then they will be able to egress from the Crew Dragon vehicle. And we just heard we should be just under five minutes away from the last of that fuel coming out of the Falcon 9 first stage. And then we'll see those events start to, to pick back up and we'll see the crew arm swing back out. They've been in those seats for a couple hours now. Uh, they typically get inside of Dragon a little over two and a half hours ahead of launch. So they've been strapped into these seats for quite a while. They are custom sized though, so they're as comfortable as, and as snug as possible. Um, obviously, since they're gonna be in them for a really long time, but most importantly, when you're doing that splashdown at the very end of the mission, you it's it's your car seat, and splashing down or landing on land is not the most gentle of procedures in a <laughs> capsule. So just really making sure that they're they're snug inside of that Dragon capsule. But we should be a little under five minutes away from the prop offload being completed. And as Dan mentioned, those suits are custom made, but the seats are also custom fit for each astronaut as well. Uh, they do remain on Crew Dragon for this mission for almost 24 hours about. Uh, so we do want to make sure that they are comfortable um, and make sure that the suits and the, the seats are comfortable enough for them to stay in that position for a while. Um, I believe when they get into orbit, they are allowed to um, get out of their seats and get a little bit more comfortable, but it, it's a long ride for them. Yeah, once once they do get on orbit, they are able to get out of the seats and actually out of their suits too, uh, since for this flight path today, they, it was gonna take them about 19 hours. So Bob and Doug will act, would actually have had about eight hours to sleep on board the Dragon capsule, so. We weren't able to launch today though. Uh, the rendezvous on Saturday should be very similar to what we would have had if we launched today, where it'll take them about 19 hours to get to the International Space Station. So they'll launch and they'll have a number of different events that we'll be able to walk you through, including manual piloting of Dragon and just really putting the spacecraft through all of the paces before it arrives at the International Space Station. Because again, this, this is a test flight and this right. is this last test before we certify the Dragon spacecraft for regular crewed flights, which will just be bringing up those long duration, six month, maybe even a year long missions. Right. And it's it should be a very exciting test flight because it's pretty much like an actual mission. Uh, when Bob and Doug get on the station, they will be perfor performing um, some research while they're up there and performing tests and, and doing some final things for this demonstration mission. But I mean, just for right now, we are just gonna continue to stay with them until we see them come out of Dragon because the launch escape system still armed while we wait for this propellant offload to complete. That's just done as a safety measure. Anytime you have rocket propellants beneath you, you wanna make sure that we have a good way for them to get out of the way. And so we should be within just a couple of minutes for that final bit of RP-1 coming off the first stage. And then we'll hear the crew get the go to disarm that launch escape system, we'll see the crew access arm swing back in. But if you're just tuning in, expecting them to be in space, we did have a scrub today due to weather. 
our next launch attempt is going to be this Saturday, May 30th at 322 p.m. Eastern Time. And just like we did today, we're going to be bringing you every single step of the way. It's going to look a little familiar if you watched all of today's, <laughs> but it's going to be just as exciting. I can imagine it might even be more exciting with all the anticipation that we've hyped this launch up for with already going through it all today. But again, the more practice we have, you know, the better off we will be. Hopefully next launch attempt, we will have a flawless launch um, and actually be able to lift off with good weather. Yeah, weather is going to be the big thing that we'll continue to watch. That was the culprit today for our scrub. And our initial weather reports already looking at about a 40% possibility of violation, probability of violation. So as John, I was saying, the optimists in us have to say that's 60% good. So <laughs> we're going to look, we're going to look at the, the good side of this. And that's roughly what we were in the days leading up to this. Uh, we won't have a rogue tropical storm forming off of South Carolina on us on uh, Saturday, but Florida weather will always be dynamic, so we'll just continue to track and hopefully get a good chance, hit that window on Saturday. And just a reminder, everything else on the vehicle and for the mission was looking good today. It was just the weather, um, which as John Aya said earlier, and Lauren even referred to, to him mentioning this, weather is the one thing that we actually cannot control on our missions. So unfortunately, it did cause us to scrub today. But the healthy, the, the vehicles are healthy. Bob and Doug were ready, um, and they should be ready to go again with the next launch, launch attempt on Saturday. Just looking at our data, it looks like that RP-1 is just about all out. So we'll just kind of stand by for a few more moments. Hopefully we get that call soon, John I. Yeah, I was going to, uh, while we're waiting to hear the call that the uh, last percentage of fuel is off, uh, I was going to comment on Jesse's uh, discussion about it was just the weather. I think during this countdown, there were more words said about the weather than <laughs> everything else. Uh -huh. uh, I'm listening right now to a weather discussion in the background. And again, for people wondering uh, if we knew that we did have bad weather, you know, even from this morning, again, we do monitor this all the way down, um, all the way down to the final minutes of the countdown. And with Florida weather being pretty sporadic, uh, sometimes we have even hurricanes coming through or, or bad weather coming through uh, and passing um, 20 minutes later and having uh, good weather for a launch. So this is why um, we continued to attempt to launch today, um, but unfortunately, 4T0 today, weather was not on our side. Yeah, and Jesse, this is John again. Uh, I dropped off to listen to a weather discussion. Uh, they were just giving the times. The uh, lightning rule uh, went green, so we could have uh, gone without a lightning concern. Uh, the attached anvil rule cleared, but the field mill rule uh, is expected to clear at uh, 58 minutes after the hour. So that's uh, another four and a half minutes from now. So we, we were close, but we needed about 25 minutes uh, 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 later launch time. It does uh, remind me at risk of uh, offending some people, but the old saying that says, it's better to be on the ground wishing you were flying than flying wishing you were on the ground. <laughs> Yes, definitely. Safety first, always, um, and making sure that when Bob and Doug do fly, they are flying safely and as planned. Um, so again, this is standard procedure for us to make sure that they do have a safe flight to the International Space Station. All right, well, for now, we're just continuing to stand by, expecting the call that all of that prop has now been offloaded from Falcon 9. All right, methane vehicle tanks to nominal TPC set points or Karingas. At this moment, the launch escape system is still armed. Once the prop offload is complete, that'll be the next step in our procedures to have Bob and Doug begin to make their way out of Dragon.
LD, count by one. LD. Uh, we have the prompt here for nominal crew egress. Okay, so we're ready for launch escape system disarm. As a firm, ready for launch escape disarm. M MD copies. Uh, you guys are ready. We'll. S yeah, launch team's ready. Go ahead and uh, advise the crew. Hey, Dragon SpaceX, uh, you copy that discussion. So with that, you are go for uh, disarming launch escape system for section two of five dot one zero zero. We'll put that work, section two, disarming the launch escape system. All right, that was the call we were waiting for, propelling off of Falcon 9. So Doug Hurley, Bob Bank, and now going to disarm the launch escape system on Dragon. And once that's disarmed, those eight Super Draco engines will be out of the mix. SpaceX Dragon uh, launch escape system has been disarmed into Alpha Decimal 3. Copy that. We concur. And showing then confirm the launch escape system has been disarmed. And Dragon SpaceX, with that confirmation, you are go to open your visors and proceed to Section 3. Okay, we'll open the visors and go to Section 3. As you heard and you can see, Bob and Doug can now open their visors and get ready for exiting the vehicle. Again, they kept their visors on while the launch escape system was armed, while prop offloading was um, continuing. And that is just to make sure that they are safe. Now that there is no more prop propellant on any of the vehicles, they are safe to have disarmed the launch escape system and now are getting ready for that crew arm to swing back the hatch to open and for them to egress. SpaceX Dragon with an update. We're holding in three decimal four and we're ready for seat rotation when you are. Copy that. Uh, we'll wait for the closeout team to open the hatch and uh, verify clearance and then we can execute seat rotation. Dragon tap. And there's that crew arm swinging arm. back Sorry. towards Dragon. Once that crew arm is in place, they will be able to open the hatch on Crew Dragon. Bob and Doug's seats will rotate back out of launch position so that they can safely get out of their seats and egress the vehicle. And we heard they'll have what they call nominal egress, so just the normal procedures for getting them out of the capsule. That means the, uh, the same closeout team that was there to get them in will be able to assist as they come out. They'll arrive and get that hatch open, and then they'll be able to rotate the seats. That'll rotate Bob and Doug pretty much forward where they'll be uh, in the original position uh, that the seats were configured when they made their way into Dragon. It just gets them a little bit out and under the displays and makes getting in and out of the capsule a little bit easier. They've been in those seats for about three hours at this point, so definitely a long day for the crew uh, as they woke up about six hours prior to our T-minus zero, had their breakfast, which we confirmed was steak and eggs, at least for <laughs> Doug Hurley. Uh, and then they proceeded through all of the suit up and the, tri uh, the trip to the pad making their way inside Dragon where they've been for about the last three hours at this point. We were on track for an on-time liftoff uh, right at 4.33 p.m. Eastern time, but did have to scrub a little under 17 minutes before launch due to weather. 